When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, Unshaken Saints, Jared Halverson here. Impressed as always that you come back for scripture study and honored that you would spend some of that time with me. We're gonna pick up right where we left off from last week. Section 124, we focused on building the Nauvoo house and the house of the Lord in Nauvoo and specifically the temple baptismal font since they were baptizing each other willy-nilly in the Mississippi River. And remember, God was okay with that as long as it's the time of your poverty, but let's get up to speed and do it right as quickly as we can. I mean, I can't blame the saints for being as excited as they were about baptisms for the dead. It is an incredible doctrine. It answers so many questions about the fate of the unevangelized, as it's called in, in technical terms. The, the, what happens to those that never had the chance to learn of Jesus Christ. It seems so simple and so straightforward, especially when we look at 1 Corinthians 15, 29, and it says it right there. Uh, it, baptism for the dead is mentioned in the Bible. But not, it's not mentioned clearly enough to explain how it's supposed to be done. In fact, that really, and, and what we're going to study today, especially in section 127 and 128, is going to help us with that, okay? It really hit me when I was at Divinity School, and I was in a class on early Christian liturgy. Now, liturgy is the study of religious ritual. And so we had a lecture one day on baptism in the early church, and our professor was incredible. She literally wrote the book on early Christian liturgy. And she was going this, uh, through this PowerPoint presentation on, on baptism in early Christianity, and had a slide that showed 1 Corinthians 15, 29 that mentions baptisms for the dead right there in the New Testament. And she said, you know what? We, we don't have any information on how this was practiced, but the fact that Paul mentions it, and especially the way he mentions it, suggests well, or proves that it was practiced in the early church. You see, 1 Corinthians 15, 29, he's not defending baptisms for the dead as if that were what was under question. What was being questioned in that chapter was the resurrection. The saints in Corinth were starting to wonder, is the resurrection real? Does that really happen? And so throughout this very long, beautiful chapter, Paul uses as many arguments as he can to defend the doctrine of resurrection. He uses eyewitness testimony, including his own. He uses, oh, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. It's fitting that death comes upon all and life will come upon all. And then he uses baptisms for the dead as another piece of evidence. It's like, why else would we be baptizing each other for the dead if the dead don't rise at all? Then baptisms for the dead would be meaningless. You see, that's the great irony of 1 Corinthians 15. He's not trying to defend baptisms for the dead. He's using that because it was just understood and accepted to defend something that we now take for granted, namely the resurrection. Uh, and there's an interesting irony there. Anyway, she explained all this and just, well, there it is. It's there in the text, and so they must have practiced it. And then she went on and she finished her lecture. Now, there was, I don't know, five or ten minutes at the end, and she said, okay, we got some time for questions and answers. And this one pastor in training raises her hand in the back and says, okay, I, I know you said that we don't know much of anything about baptisms for the dead, but I never even heard of that. I mean, I, I guess I should have known it if I knew my Bible. Shame on me. But I didn't even know it was in there. Is there anything else you can say about that doctrine? And this great professor, not a member of the church, but knowing that I was one, she looked down at me and smiled and said, uh, Jared, you want to take this one? <laughs> and I smiled back and said, you bet. And so for the last 10 minutes, I explained baptisms for the dead, doctrinally, and, and how we practice it in the temples. And I mean, honestly, there were times at Divinity School, I felt like I had an unfair advantage because of the fullness of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. And that was one of those days. It, it's amazing the answer we have to those questions of if Jesus was serious with Nicodemus in saying that you, you cannot enter the kingdom of God if you are not born of water and of the Spirit, then how do we make baptism available for everyone? N nobody understands that but us. And it's an incredible thing that, that I don't think we should be taking for granted. If we grew up in the church, maybe we do because we've been doing it for so long. 
From age 12, you can go to the temple and do baptisms for the dead. Actually, it reminds me when we lived in Tennessee, it was funny, we had a very large geographic ward. And so we needed a central meeting place before we go and go to the Nashville temple and bring the youth. And the best place for that was at the temple, excuse me, was at the hospital to go to the temple. And I just remember, uh, maybe my ears were attuned to non-Latter-day Saints since I spent so much time among them. But uh, they were announcing baptisms. Like, yep, we're going to take the youth on a trip to do baptisms for the dead. And so we're going to meet at the hospital and then go do baptisms for the dead. And I just thought, man, from a non-LDS ear, that sounds really weird. Like, yeah, we'll start at the hospital and the ones that are closest to it. Then once they expire, then we can go baptize them. It's like, ooh, no, that, that's not how we do things. Okay, that is not the practice of the church. But what is the practice is incredible. But we, we grew into an understanding of it, line upon line and precept upon precept. As I said, just reading 1 Corinthians 15, 29 is not enough to recreate the doctrine, or, or let alone to understand the practice of how it's supposed to be done. Which perhaps is one of the reasons that Joseph didn't understand baptisms for the dead just by reading that passage. In fact, you remember when we studied section 76 and these incredible visions of the degrees of glory? Those ones could have grown out of 1 Corinthians 15 also, because it speaks of the sun, the moon, and the stars. It speaks of bodies celestial and bodies terrestrial. It, it's, it, to me, it's incredible that Joseph received the visions of the degrees of glory in, when he was studying John 5, not when he was studying 1 Corinthians 15, which tells me something, that we often think of you know, somebody pouring over Scripture and trying to figure out what's missing from our practice, and we need to to bring these things out if we're going to restore New Testament Christianity. That's, that's one approach, and that seemed to be the approach of an Alexander Campbell, for example, other restorationist groups in the 19th century. But that wasn't Joseph's approach. It wasn't, let's study Scripture and see what we're missing. It was, turn to God and ask Him what we're missing. Again, the JST is an incredible example of that. It's, Heavenly Father, anything you want to add here? Well, to see the visions of the degrees of glory grow out of John 5. It's not scripture to Joseph. It is God to Joseph. And then after the fact, getting to places in scripture where he's probably like, oh, Paul knew about this too. That's amazing. The same would have been true of his understanding of baptism for the dead. And eventually getting to 1 Corinthians 15 and seeing, yes, that was practiced in the early church as well. You see, like I said, it's been a line upon line growth of understanding. In section 76, in fact, when he sees the terrestrial kingdom, he's, he recognizes that those who never accepted the gospel in this life, but accepted in the spirit world, will go to the terrestrial kingdom. Now, that doesn't seem fair until you realize, oh, it's those that had the chance to accept it in this life. Rejected it here, accepted it there. Okay, that's terrestrial. Uh, but as far as those that never had the opportunity, we're still not sure what happens. So wait a while, line upon line, precept upon precept. Later, he has a vision. This will, be show, this will show up in section 137, which we'll study in a couple of weeks. It's out of chronological order in the Doctrine and Covenants. But he has a vision of Alvin, his older brother, and others that are in the celestial kingdom. And he scratches his head going, but Alvin was never baptized. How is that possible? And he understands through that vision that those who would have received the gospel, if they'd lived to see it, had the opportunity to accept it, there's nothing holding them but down to the terrestrial kingdom. That's celestial kingdom for them, which makes more sense. That's, that's just as well as merciful. But that still doesn't explain baptism. Okay, they can have the celestial kingdom. But uh, born of water and born of the Spirit, that never happened for Alvin in this life. So how do we go about that? Now, this was on the saint's mind. There's an account when Joseph Fielding, for example, was wondering about those who died before the Restoration and, and how it, will they ever receive a baptism. And his thought was, well, maybe post-resurrection, maybe at the beginning of the millennium when there's the, the morning of the first resurrection and they are back upon the earth, then priesthood holders can baptize them. Well, not a bad idea. That didn't end up being the truth, but at least they're thinking about this. Well, it was at a funeral of Seymour Brunson in uh, August of 1840 when Joseph finally publicly reveals the doctrine of baptisms for the dead. Again, it didn't come to him when he was studying 1 Corinthians 15, 29, when he worked on the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. It has to, line upon line, waits on the Lord. 
and waits on our readiness to receive and to understand. And it finally came, and what a perfect setting, at a funeral, where you want to give hope to the bereaved. Well, this is now going to give hope to everyone, because there is a way for the blessings of the fullness of the gospel and the ordinances of salvation to be extended to all of God's children who have ever lived. As we've said before, the, the expanse of the umbrella of the restored church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is as broad as the redeeming reach of Jesus Christ. It's as broad as the love of God itself. And the fact that we can engage in work for the dead, it is worth rejoicing over. And we're going to see a lot of rejoicing today. Now, that's going to have to wait till section 127 and 128. And before we get there, we need to study 125 and 126, which are very brief revelations, but have a lot of relevance once we have the eyes to see. So let's hope that we can see. 125 has to do with the growth of the church. The saints are streaming into Nauvoo. Uh, they were scattered all over different counties in Missouri, and, and now they're all crossing the river. They're all coming, and missionary work has never stopped. Despite opposition and persecution and everything else, missionary work is still going, going on. And so people are still joining the church and coming together. To the point that little old commer commerce that's now beautiful Nauvoo, or is getting there at least, is still not big enough. Now we saw hints of this earlier. You remember Jackson County was supposed to be the center place, but the center doesn't encompass the whole. It's going to extend beyond it. Uh, we saw Kirtland was going to be a stake of Zion. And that the stakes needed to be strengthened so that the cords could be lengthened and hold up this ever-expanding tent. Remember back in section 82, where it said that Zion must increase in beauty and in holiness. Her borders must be enlarged. Her stakes must be strengthened. So there's growth. Fast forward in section 107, it talks about a certain number of church leaders being needed until the borders of Zion are enlarged and it becomes necessary to have more leaders. Or section 124 just last week, where it speaks of Zion and Jerusalem, the two headquarters in the millennial day, but also all of the stakes, plural, of Zion that will grow up. Specifically, it referred to those places, plural, which I have appointed for refuge. Those shall be the places, plural, for your baptisms for your dead. So despite the fact we're always talking about the gathering, it was never intended to gather to solely one place. There's going to be places. And that's what's on the mind of the saints here in section 125. Specifically, do we, if, when we outgrow Nauvoo, where do we go? Do we extend eastward into the Illinois prairie? Do we extend westward across the Mississippi River? I mean, we don't want to go on the south side where we're back in the Missouri. Can't do that. But on the north side, that's the Iowa territory. So can we go there? And that's the question that's on their mind. In verse 1, what is the will of the Lord concerning the saints in the territory of Iowa? And his answer, verse 2, Verily thus saith the Lord, I say unto you, if those who call themselves by my name and are assaying to be my saints, if they will do my will and keep my commandments concerning them, let them gather themselves together unto the places, plural, which I shall appoint unto them by my servant Joseph, and build up cities, again, plural, unto my name that they may be prepared for that which is in store for a time to come. And what exactly is to come? Well, the second coming. And we will need oh, places, plural, of refuge, sanctuary cities to which we can gather and prepare the earth for the coming of Jesus Christ. So there's going to be more than one gathering place. But what I love about verse 2 is the way he sets that up. Do you call yourselves by my name? And are you trying to live up to that title? Remember we saw that word essaying before, which means to try, to attempt, to do your very best. So are you trying to be a saint? You've taken my name. Are you trying to live up to it? Are you doing my will or trying? Are you essaying to keep my commandments? Because as long as you are, then gather anywhere. It's okay for you to gather unto other places, which I will appoint through my servant Joseph Smith. I mean, this is going to go back to the whole idea of how you live is far more important than where you live. Remember all those saints that were beelining it down to Zion, to the place before they became Zion, the people, and how, what a problem that was? Well, reverse it. And here in verse 2, if you're trying, 
If you're working towards the Zion personality, if it's becoming your lifestyle, then the location is almost beside the point. Iowa will be just as good as Illinois. In fact, either one will be just as good as Missouri, even though Missouri needs to be on your radar because that is going to be the center place, uh, not, notwithstanding the other spots that surround it. But the important point of, of verse two is, how are you trying to live? Not where do you want to? So verse three, let them build up a city unto my name upon the land opposite the city of Nauvoo. So western side of the Mississippi. And let the name of Zarahemla be named upon it. I love the Lord's choice of names there that he chooses. Yep, we're going to go ahead. Western side, Iowa territory, great. But call it Zarahemla. Now, if you remember in section 84, five years to the day where the Book of Mormon came forth and the Lord chastens them for treating it lightly, the voice from the dust was beginning to collect dust and the Lord was angry. Now, not everyone was under that condemnation. Uh, you get a guy like Party P. Pratt, for example, who absolutely loved the Book of Mormon and named so many of his kids after, I mean, there's an Abish Pratt. There is a Tiancum Pratt. And those are obscure Book of Mormon names because he'd already used a bunch of the more famous ones. Okay, here's a guy who loved the Book of Mormon and you can see it in naming things. Now, there's plenty of biblical names that can be used for places. They're all over the place throughout America. And it could have been that case with that, what, what's across the river from Nauvoo? But no, let's dip into the Book of Mormon place names and call it Zarahemla, that headquarters of the church in ancient America. The Lord places value in the Book of Mormon. In fact, to me, there's something beautifully fitting about a, a Book of Mormon Zarahemla being built across the river from an Old Testament Nauvoo by a bunch of people trying to restore New Testament Christianity under the direction of revelations being recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants. How's that for, for a scriptural people? You name the book of scripture and it's in there. Uh, I love this. Now, verse four, let all those who come from the east, the west, the north, the south, that have desires to dwell therein. See how God is honoring your desires? I, I'm less concerned about where you're coming from, north, south, east, west. I'm even less concerned about where you're going to. What's your desire? Those that have desires to dwell therein, let them take up their inheritance in the same, as well as in the city of Nashville. Now, my ears perk up for that, for Nashville, Tennessee, but that wasn't it. Sorry, Music City. Uh, this is Nashville, Iowa, uh, a small town there. Or in the city of Nauvoo, or in all the stakes which I have appointed, saith the Lord. Do you see how open the Lord is? Despite the fact that there are specific places of gathering, there's also a flexibility on the other side of things where the Lord, I, I remember section 80 when Stephen Burnett and Eden Smith are sent on a mission and they say, go, go north, south, east, west. It mattereth not. You cannot go amiss. Well, that's one thing. Yeah, go anywhere to go find people. But then you got to bring it back here, right? Because there's only one place that they can live. Well, no, they can come from wherever. They can settle wherever. I mean, there's going to be places, plural, and they're going to expand. The church is going to sp spread forth and fill the earth. In the meantime, yeah, we have to be a little bit more specific because we need to gather sufficient numbers so that we can actually build houses to God. But if you desire uh, Nauvoo, great. If you desire Zarahemla, fine. If you desire, if you're more small town style rather than big town, if you want little Nashville, Iowa, go with that. It's all good as long as you are essaying to be one of my saints and to do my will and to keep my commandments. I love the way the Lord is trying to balance unity and diversity in that one little revelation or community and individuality. See, these are contraries that are becoming really hard to prove in our day where we no longer care about community. It's all about individuality and unity is looked down upon because diversity is all that seems to matter. Now, typically that means we've overcorrected something from a previous something that was unbalanced. And sure enough, in earlier years, it was too much unity and not any diversity allowed. It was all community and no individuality. And as is usually the case, when we're trying to prove contraries, the pendulum is just swinging too widely. Correcting, nope, overcorrecting, darn it. Well, I love section 125 because to me, it helps illustrate the proper balance 
Because on the one hand, you have the flexibility of live wherever you want, basically. But on the other, you have the, the uniformity of, but call yourself by my name and try to do my will and keep my commandments. Be a real saint. Whether you're a, an Illinois saint or an Iowa saint, be a saint. Whether it's Nauvoo or Nashville or Zarahemla or anywhere else, do your very best to follow my commands. Now, there's one other place I want to use as an illustration of that. And that's from the Old Testament. In the book of Numbers, chapter 32, there's an interesting thing that takes place among the tribes of Israel as they're preparing to cross the Jordan River and go conquer the Promised Land. Now, the geography of the land is, is important here. Because west of Jordan, you see, they crossed the, the Red Sea. They're now coming around the east side, so they're going to have to go back and cross the Jordan River from east to west to get back into the Promised Land. Which means they've seen kind of the Transjordan area, modern-day Jordan versus modern-day Israel. And as far as where you'd want to live, Jordan has its, it has its positives over the Jerusalem area. Especially if you have flocks and herds that you want to graze. I mean, this goes back even earlier to Abraham and Lot. Remember, they both had flocks and herds, and they're getting too big and numerous for the area. And so Abraham, very selflessly, since all the land belongs to him, says to his nephew Lot, hey, why don't we split up our area so that we can both grow, and I'll let you have dibs. You can have first choice. Do you want east side or west side? Now, if you were humble and smart, you'd say, man, he's kind to even share any of this with me. So I'll take the lesser of the two. You go ahead and choose the better spot. But a little selfishly, Lot says, oh, I get dibs? Sweet. I'll take the east side of Jordan. That's, that's better. And in many ways it was, at least as far as, as flocks and herds are concerned. I mean, up in Jerusalem, that's a rough place. Very rocky, very mountainous, and so on. Well, as the Israelites are coming around, two and a half tribes, so it's Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, who are, more, or are herdsmen, they see the east side of Jordan and fall in love with it and think, this place would be perfect for us. Well, great. The only problem is, technically, that's not the promised land. And so they ask Moses to think outside the box, which when we think of Old Testament strictness, we don't think about thinking outside the box very much. Well, here's the miracle of, of what takes place in Numbers 32. They say, can we stay on the east side? And Moses' concern initially is, well, how's that going to work? Because we need all hands on deck if we're going to conquer the promised land. We need unity to be able to achieve that goal. But, proving the contrary, I do recognize the need for diversity within our unity. I do recognize the need for your individuality because you're, you're, you're coming from, at, at, at things from a different angle. You're herdsmen and others maybe not so much. So I'll tell you what. Because we need you, will you cross the Jordan River with us? Will you help us conquer the promised land? And once we do, once we achieve that unified goal, then feel free to come back to the east side of the Jordan River and settle down on this side. It'll just be kind of be an annex, I guess, of the promised land. To me, that is such a beautiful illustration of the kind of balance I'm trying to strike here. That if we can prioritize unity, then we can welcome diversity. If we can have unity with diversity, as opposed to diversity without any unity, then, then of course, come, conquer. To me, verse 2 suggests the idea of conquer the promised land. Are you a saint to be a saint? Can you show your loyalty first? I've learned that myself as I have sometimes tried to think outside the box, whether it's in my ward in leadership or whether it's in church education and just trying to suggest some things. I, I hope that I have proven my loyalty first. And I've realized that as I do so, then typically my leaders are much more open to my outside the box thinking because they know I'm not trying to buck the system or break or even bend the rules. It's simply a matter of, I, no, I'm all in on this. All I want is to conquer the promised land. But there are different perspectives and different views and things. I love what B.H. Roberts once said, and I don't think the quote came from him originally, that in, all, in essential things, unity, in non-essential things, diversity, and in all things, charity. And, and I, I get a sense of that balance here in 125. 
which side of the river you're on doesn't matter so much, whether modern Israel on the Mississippi or ancient Israel along the Jordan. What matters is, are we living the gospel of Jesus Christ? There are going to be different perspectives on how to live that. And that's a beautiful thing. If our loyalty is all there to establishing the kingdom of God upon the earth, when Jesus called his original 12 and he wanted someone who worked for Rome, welcome Matthew, and someone who couldn't stand Rome, thank you Simon, the zealot, not Simon Peter. Uh, to understand then, we're going to have to navigate the kingdom of God under the, the Roman imperial thumb. So I want people on different sides of the issue to bring their very best thinking. To think of the Quorum of the Twelve today, and, and wherever you happen to be on the political spectrum or the social spectrum, left or right, uh, if you're thinking about your, the way your ward uh, or your ward council is made up, it, it's a beautiful thing to see people, diverse perspectives, diverse experiences. I mean, in some ways, it's like what Paul talked about, the body of Christ, and the eye versus the ear, or the hand versus the foot. On the one hand, we need different gifts, different abilities from different body parts. On the other hand, it all needs to be connected into the same body. And are we trying to accomplish a unified goal, even in different ways of trying to reach that? I hope this is making sense, because I think, again, culturally, we're overcorrecting, and we have, we have eliminated any thoughts or possibilities of unity. There, there's no common ground in society, it seems. But it's all about the diversity. But, but the previous version was flawed as well when there was no wiggle room and it was my way or the highway and there's only one, one size fits all. I'm grateful for an increase in, in openness and welcoming to diversity within the culture of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As far as doctrinally, it's always been there. Just get the order right. Make sure you have conquered the promised land before you decide on what specific areas you want to settle in. In some ways, another parallel to this is the letter of the law. Mastering that needs to precede a desire to explore the spirit of the law. Go read 1 Nephi 16 again. And notice that when Lehi discovers the Liahona, with all of its marvelous flexibility, with spindles moving and, and words changing and leading in the more fertile parts of the wilderness, but not as narrowly defined as an iron rod. To go from an iron rod letter of the law to a Leahona spirit of the law, remember the placement. Lehi did not receive the Leahona until he had proven his mastery of obedience. Look at where it appears in 1 Nephi 16 and go back just a couple of verses. And it comes right on the heels of, of Lehi proving to God that I will be obedient in all things. I will conquer the promised land west of Jordan before I decide to settle down in an annexed part of promised land on the eastern edge. I, I hope that makes sense. Now that balance, that proving of contraries in 125, is followed by another proving of contraries in 126. And this one has to do with Brigham Young. Now, Brother Brigham has been incredibly faithful. When apostles seemed to be falling left and right in the apostasy in Kirtland, his knees never buckled. He was as, I mean, you want to talk about proving loyalty? Well, Brigham Young was your guy. But he has been so busy ever since the day he got baptized. And most of that busyness has been in sharing the gospel, going on missions. This is Mr. Hurrah for Israel himself, even though you're on death's doorstep. Okay, here's the one that's commando mission back to far west Missouri to start a mission to go back east and cross the, the Atlantic and go take the gospel to the British Isles. He has been so, he's, he has wasted and worn out his life to this point. And he's still got a long life of church service ahead. But the counsel that he's given here in this brief section 126 is, is so helpful to him and helpful to us as we try to, to prove a contrary here that's essential. Verse 1, he's addressed in two different ways by two different people. First, from Joseph Smith. Dear and well-beloved brother Brigham Young. And, and few people were more beloved and brotherly to Joseph than Brigham Young was. So faithful, so loyal, so dear brother, well-beloved brother Brigham. Verily thus saith the Lord unto you, 
So now it's the Lord's turn to address you. And how does he do it? My servant, Brigham. I love the difference there. To a prophet, you're my well-beloved brother. To God, you are my servant. And Brigham Young beautifully fulfilled both of those roles. What's the message from God? It is no more required at your hand to leave your family as in times past, for your offering is acceptable to me. Verse 2, I have seen your labor and toil in journeyings for my name, and it has been laborious and toilsome from the beginning to Canada, to other places in the United States, to the British Isles. It's incredible all that Brother Brigham did to build up the kingdom. In fact, he's been having so much on-the-job training lately. As the saints are driven out of, of uh, Missouri, Joseph Smith can't lead the exodus because he is in Liberty Jail. So who does? Thomas B. Marsh had apostatized during those years, and so it falls on Brother Brigham. And you want to talk about good on-the-job training. You want to talk about crash course in exodus? That's helpful since you're going to have to lead a bigger one, not out of Missouri, but this time out of the entire United States. And so the, the practice that Brigham Young is getting in so many areas uh, is, is really fascinating. And the Lord recognizes that and accepts that and lets him know it's family time now. It's time to stay rather than go. We saw that at the end of section 124 last week, that some group people need to stay and other people need to travel. And, and you, you go, do you, do you preside from one spot? Now, verse 3, he expands upon that. I therefore command you to send my word abroad and take a special care of your family from this time henceforth and forever. Amen. So it's not that I'm just releasing you from your church responsibilities. That's not it. The word still needs to go forth. You just don't have to be physically present everywhere that it goes. You can send it. Remember, we saw that back in section 84, one of the great missionary and priesthood sections. Go ye into all the world, and unto whatsoever place ye cannot go, ye shall send. Well, now's your chance to do some sending, Brigham. Uh, and it's time to stay in Nauvoo. Stay and preside over the Quorum of the Twelve. Stay and delegate responsibility. Stay and send the gospel. It's going to end up blessing the people you delegate it and send it through, as well as send it to. I mean, it reminds me of, of COVID missionaries last year. And I can't go because of social distancing, but I can send. And boy, did they send. And not only did it bless them and the people that they served, it changed missionary work. And we, will, we have a more expansive, kind of nimble, quick in our feet missionary department because of some of the lessons we learned during COVID-19. Well, for a different purpose, it's stay and send but also it's a stay and take care of your family. I mean, on the one hand, you are a special witness of the name of Christ in all the world. On the other hand, you must take special care of your family. Even the way that revelation ended, care for your family from this time henceforth and forever. You see, there aren't many callings that are henceforth and forever. In a bishopric, it's henceforth for the next five years. Uh, in a stake presidency, it's henceforth for the next nine years. Most callings are henceforth and a little while. Family is henceforth and forever. And it deserves our very best efforts. So don't leave them like you used to. Stay and take special care. Now, as we saw in verse 3, this balance of you're still sending the word, you're still building the kingdom but you're also taking special care of your family. Striking that balance is incredibly difficult. I mean, striking balance always is. That's why we're constantly trying to prove contraries, looking for the Goldilocks zone, and constantly course correcting along the way. And that's hard to do, not just if you remember the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. I have no idea how they do it. But even on our individual level, how do I balance? In fact, in COVID, post-COVID world, as we're emerging, they keep talking about work-life balance. And since we, we got a taste of working from home and other things, how do I achieve a better work-life balance? Well, in the kingdom of God, how do I achieve a better home church balance? I mean, we even saw prior to COVID, let's go from three hours to two hours at, at church. And let's start shifting the center of gravity from the chapel to the home. 
Remember last week, Nauvoo Temple, Nauvoo House, both are, are, na- are gi- buildings given to God's name, okay? Dedicated spaces of worship and righteousness. So how do I, where's the center of gravity for me? And that's really, really hard to, to figure out. Only the Holy Ghost can let us know when we need to course correct. And I've been spending too much time serving God's children at the expense of my own. Or, flip side, I've been a little too selfish with my time and only raising my own children when other parents need help raising theirs. That's the tricky part when the church, we often, I, it hit me when I was talking about the church as our mother, right? Uh, Christ is the father of our covenant, church is the mother of our covenant, and so the church is there to nurture us. It's a great analogy, but on the other hand, we are the church. So how does, I'm my mom, how does this work? Uh, well, it nurtures me, but I'm nurturing, nurturing others. So it's all part of this, wow, no wonder it's so tricky to figure out. Well, let me give you one piece of advice from that, that 126 kind of reminded me of before we move forward into 127. And this was an administrative uh, approach that I learned from the very first bishop that I served with. My wife and I were newlyweds. We moved into a student, a married student ward, and our incredible bishop, Ron Hershey, uh, called me into the bishopric and called my wife to the, as the Relief Study president. We got to hold hands during ward council. It was the best. Uh, but our bishop was a fan of what he called exploratory interviews. And that was a practice that, that we, I, I shared with other bishops in later bishoprics, and they eyes lit up like, this is genius. And so with Bishop Berg and with Bishop Taylor, we did uh, exploratory interviews as well. It added a little work to the bishop, or to the bishopric, but it was so worth it. What Bishop Hershey taught us about exploratory interviews kind of came from Oliver Cowdery. When the Lord says to him, you took no thought save it was to ask me? Come on, Oliver, you got to study this out in your mind. Don't just rely on inspiration when you've got some information to gather first. And, I, and we realized as a bishopric, we were only relying on inspiration. Thankfully, it came, but also it came with a little bit of, you could be doing some more homework. And I think in some ways, you're putting your members in a, in a difficult position because they were probably raised with the, the, the righteous mentality of, I will always accept a calling even if it's going to come at a, at a cost beyond the sacrifice that God actually is requiring of them. Let me explain what I mean. An exploratory interview was a, an opportunity for the person extending the calling to sit down with a person that they were thinking of extending the calling to, but not to make anything official yet and to specify that from the start. We would sit down with someone and say, you know, we've been praying about you. We've been praying about our ward, and there's a position, that, a calling that needs to be filled, and we, as we've thought, and as we pondered, and discussed, and, and prayed, we really feel you would be perfect for it. But, uh, before we, we officially extend it, we realize there's some homework we need to do with you to find out about your availability, about your, your family circumstance. But, I mean, as far as we know, as we asked God, is this the kind of person? Does, does she have the, the character traits or does he have the experience that he, they'd be able to serve in this calling? Or would this be the kind of calling that would really stretch them in beautiful ways? And it's like, yeah, of course. Just there's some other things you don't know about their circumstance. And there's better ways to find it out. And it's from the person directly. And so again, that's when we're doing our homework. And we sit down and ask, uh, what, what are you going through? And, and is this something that would even work for you? You see, the interesting thing about it is, it, it, actually, it was amazing to watch their eyes light up like, wait, wait, you're, you're asking me about availability and possibility and without the pressure of saying yes right now? I said, yeah, that, this is just us doing homework, okay? It's thinking out loud and, and kind of putting our cards on the table and really discussing about our, our possibilities. That doesn't excuse us or you from continuing to seek inspiration, but we just really want to find some information here. And I would usually tell them, by the end of our conversation, kind of one of three possibilities. Number one, all your information might confirm our inspiration. And both you and I will feel by the end of the conversation that, yeah, this is perfect. And, and let's make this official. The other possibility is we will both know very clearly that this is not possible. Yes, you're the perfect kind of person for this calling, but not right now. Whoa. 
everything you're going through, all that's on your plate. Nope. We're, we're, we're uh, thank you for that information. Uh, and, and don't lose any sleep over saying no to a calling because you didn't say no to it. I'm not extending it. That, that's crystal clear. I'm so glad that our information is now helping us clarify some things. The other possibility, the third is, hmm, I'm not sure what to do now, but I am grateful I did some extra homework. Let me take this information back to the bishopric so we can discuss it together and keep counseling and keep seeking God's confirmation because the Lord might want to push you through a difficult thing and this calling might help be what helps you through. Or... He might feel that, nope, it's no more required at your hand to leave your family as in times past. It's, we're trying to understand the, the church home balance, just like you are. And so thank you for helping us with that. We'll, let me call you back, okay? We'll meet again in a few days. I, I hope that makes sense as from, from a, a church leadership perspective. I was amazed at how grateful people were to just know you're, you're, trying, you're trying to strike the same balance that I'm trying. Remember that word we saw back in section 73, in as much as it is practicable. And we spent a little time talking about that word that we never use. And to me, practicable is somewhere in between practical and possible. You see, sometimes, well, would it be possible for you to serve in this calling? It's like, well, possible, yes. I, don't, I guess I don't have to sleep, technically, or I, somebody else can raise my kids, or... Uh, I could quit my job or drop out of school. Um, I don't know how else it would it'd be possible, but that would make it possible. Well, that's probably too hot on the Goldilocks side of things. Practical, though, still might be too cold. Because I'm amazed at how many times I've been asked to do impractical things and have, in the church. And they have blessed my life profoundly. God doesn't want us to serve out of mere practicality. But neither does he want to stretch us to the absolute limits of possibility. So somewhere in the middle, is it practicable? And, and to see Brother Brigham, who will yet have a lifetime of intense church service, and talk about intense family life too, with plural marriage and everything else. I mean, it's to have to take special care of his kids as well as the Lord's kids, wherever they might be. Oh, he's going to have to learn to strike this balance. And maybe early on, as the mantle of president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles is settling upon his shoulders, so is the need to figure out himself, oh, where to be along that spectrum. It's an area I need a lot of improvement in. Ask my kids. <laughs> uh, it's, it's an area, though, that we can, we can seek the Lord's guidance in any given moment is now a time to, to build the kingdom or is now a time to take special care of my children at home? Sometimes those two can be taking place simultaneously. That, that's a win-win for everybody. But I do challenge us as individuals. If your bishopric or stake presidency doesn't believe in, in uh, exploratory interviews or it hasn't crossed their mind, uh, you can speak up. Not to say, oh no, I'm not going to accept this calling. It doesn't have to be an automatic yes or an automatic no, I guess, I guess is what I'm saying. You can simply say, bishop or stake president, and I've done this before in certain situations, just to say, I am as loyal as the day is long. I am trying to, I am essaying to be a saint. I want to do God's will and keep God's commandments. And I will never say no to a calling before it's officially extended. Can I explain to you my circumstance? Can I let you know what I'm dealing with or going through or trying to, the, 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 the yeah, special care I'm trying to take of my family at home? And can I just, it's that phrase in Isaiah, thy walls are continually before me. Let me show you my walls. And then I will trust you and your keys to know what Heavenly Father's will would be for me and for my family. I, once I give you full disclosure, then I can give full acceptance also. Because I know I've been heard. And that your view from the tower includes my view from the foxhole. And that you'll be able to, to add my information to your inspiration. And I'll trust whatever you decide. You get a sense of that? Is there a, 
to me, there's a feeling of loyalty and also a feeling of trust and of openness and of willingness, but also to me, there's just something about either party adding the information to the inspiration. And so whether it's church leaders doing exploratory interviews, asking for information or the individual themselves offering it, but offering it in a way that I'm just trying to explain practicability, not practicality, nor possibility. Just, this is where I'm at. And I pray, I know the Lord knows all of those things. I just want to make sure that, that we are on the same uh, understanding. And once I know that you understand me, then I am totally open, even to be pushed beyond what I thought were my limits, because I know you now understand what I'm up against. And you're taking that to the Lord. I, I, I hope that makes sense. To me, the, these little revelations in 125 and 126 have some beautiful applicability in the circumstances we find ourselves in, especially in some really important contraries uh, that we're trying to prove, places we need to balance. Now, what we have left for today then is 127 and 128, which are masterpieces these are, I mean, we got to get a sense of Joseph's letter writing a couple, two weeks ago in section 121, 2, 3. And the letters he wrote from Liberty Jail. 127 and 128 are letters that he wrote from, uh, maybe you could call it a prison. Uh, he's living, he's basically hiding out in an attic of, of John Taylor's parents' home uh, and, and just lying low because there's some danger. You see, Lilburn Boggs, who signed the extermination order, is no longer the governor of Missouri, but he's still no friend of the saints, and that animosity goes both ways. Well, someone tried to kill him, and the Missourians immediately jumped to conclusions and said, oh, it must have been Joe Smith. Well, since he wouldn't cross the river, he must have sent one of his avenging angels, it was probably Orrin Porter Rockwell. Well, that's always kind of funny when people say, well, the best evidence against or the, the best evidence to say that Orrin Rock, Porter Rockwell couldn't possibly have been the one to try it is the fact that Lilburn Boggs survived the attempt. Uh, it's, it's like, oh, if Porter Rockwell had done it, yeah, there's no surviving that. Okay, uh, But Joseph is in hiding, uh, just lying low so that they don't try to drag him across the river back to Missouri where the extermination order still stands. And he's not going to, I mean, yes, they say they're seeking justice for Boggs, but it's going to be an injustice to Joseph Smith, as Liberty Jail was and everything leading up to it. But he writes a pair of letters to the rest of the saints and has uh, church leaders read it to the saints. You see in Nauvoo, if you've been there, just down the hill from the, the temple site is this grove. And that became the kind of the outdoor uh, gathering area for the saints to hear Joseph preach or others. And so he writes these letters and sends them uh, to be read to the saints. And they are beautiful. You get a sense of, of Joseph's heart and soul. You get a sense of what's on his mind and the kinds of things that the Lord is revealing to him. I mean, borrowing from what we just saw in section 126, he can't come among them safely, but he can send. And so he sends. And, and what he says is beautiful. 127 verse 1. For as much as the Lord has revealed unto me that my enemies, both in Missouri and this state, so opposition is increasing in Illinois as well, were again in the pursuit of me. So maybe this again is a combination of inspiration and information. He's probably hearing rumors like, oh, Joseph, they're out to get you. This is what happened to Boggs down in Missouri and so on. But also the inspiration of the Lord revealing to him, your enemies are out to get you and you need to be careful. Okay. The same Lord who told a Joseph to take Mary and, and a baby Jesus to Egypt to protect them. The same Lord that told a Lehi to gather his family and flee Jerusalem. Or that told a Mosiah, well, even just one generation later, you don't have to go that far forward, to tell a Nephi to leave Laman and Lemuel and find greener pastures. Or then a Mosiah to leave his territory and eventually come to a new place called Zarahemla. It's amazing how often the Lord guides us out of danger to find the places of peace. And that's what the Lord is doing here. Now, Joseph goes on, inasmuch as they pursue me without a cause. In his next letter, in 128, he'll talk about a different cause, a cause of Christ that is worth engaging in. But these people have no cause. 
but they don't need one. They're still just going to pursue me. They have not the least shadow or coloring of justice or right on their side in the getting up of their persecutions against me. And inasmuch as their pretensions are all founded in falsehood of the blackest dye. You see what he's describing there? I like all those P words. They pursue, they prosecute, they pretend. That's what pretensions are. And it's just interesting what Joseph is up against his whole life. Uh, the angel Moroni warned him, your name will be had for good and evil among all nations. We saw some of that in section 122 and 123 two weeks ago. But founded in falsehood, yes, they, he has to disabuse the public mind. That's what he says at the beginning of Joseph Smith history. So what's Joseph do? I have thought it expedient and wisdom in me to leave the place for a short season for my own safety and the safety of this people. So he's thinking of them, not just of himself. And then kind of business-like, he ends verse 1, I would say to all those with whom I have business that I have left my affairs with agents and clerks who will transact all business in a prompt and proper manner and will see that all my debts are canceled in due time by turning out property or otherwise as the case may require or as the circumstances may admit of. When I learn that the storm is fully blown over, then I will return to you again. So some things I can delegate. And the kinds of things, you know, with the finances and, and canceling debts and so on, yes, delegate that, other people can take care of it. Other things I cannot delegate, like receiving revelation and making known the will of God. So I'm not going to delegate that. That I can do from this attic. This I can do as I send. In fact, Wilfred Woodruff uh, compared this to uh, the Apostle John being banished to the Isle of Patmos. And there was was Joseph in his, his upper attic Patmos, sending, sending epistles to the saints. I do love the way he ended verse 1, though. When I learn that the storm is fully blown over, I'll return to you. Joseph had such a perspective on adversity. Learned the hard way through a lifetime of, of getting used to it. That waves crash, but then the storm settles. And if you can just ride out the wave or duck below it as it crashes above you, there's still air up there. Come back to the surface. Day, dark days do get brighter in the morning. Good Fridays, which aren't so good, the crucifixion was Good Friday, is followed by a glorious Easter Sunday. And so hold out for better days. If you are suffering, if you are struggling, whether it's pursuit or persecution or pretension or just adversity and affliction, trust that the storm will ultimately blow over and things will be better again. Joseph had that faith and, and we need to have it as well. In verse 2, as for the perils, there's another P word for him, as for the perils which I am called to pass through, they seem but a small thing to me. This is the same sufferer who was told just a few revelations ago that your adversity and your afflictions will be but a small moment. His, his, he's wrapping his mind and heart around that kind of eternal perspective. All these perils are a small thing to me. He goes on, The envy and wrath of man have been my common lot all the days of my life. Interesting combination there. The envy and wrath. I mean, the wrath is the most off, the obvious part. People are constantly attacking him, whether physically or in the press. But to, to associate envy with that as well, to me, is very interesting. You see, there's a holy envy that leads to emulation. I want to be more like that. Or I wish, I wish I could, that we believed in those kinds of ways or acted in those kinds of ways. So a holy envy that leads to emulation. But there's an unholy envy that leads to persecution. Not a sense of they are up and I want to rise to be more like them, but rather they are above and I want to drag them down to be on my level. Uh, my daughter just, I never knew this, but she said that through a, a lot of her eighth grade year, she was just constantly d uh, called Molly Mormon and just talked about how much that hurt her. And it's interesting to see the envy that sometimes hides behind the wrath of just knowing, because many of them were other church members, but, but just 
knowing that they should be holding themselves to a higher standard, but rather than taking the self-discipline to truly essay to be a saint, well, let's just drag them down and make their sainthood almost a dirty word and make them ashamed or embarrassed about it. Uh, it it's, it's an interesting thing to see that envy coupled with the wrath. And honestly, if we can see it as envy, maybe we'll be able to endure it better and not succumb to the wrath that, that it also follows. And then he puts it this way. And I, and I love, again, verse 2 is such a beautiful peek into the personality of Joseph Smith and the way he dealt with his, his innumerable trials. Here he says, right after saying that, that envy and wrath were the common lot all the days of my life, it's almost a sense of, I mean, get used to it, learn to endure it well because it's not going anywhere. And sure enough, I mean, his childhood leg operation, that's nobody's fault, but just brutal difficulty. Then losing everything and having to start all, all over again multiple times in childhood and then followed by multiple times in adulthood. Ridiculed in his adolescence, rejected by those who should have been my friends, he said. I mean, rejected by his own in-laws when he wanted to marry Emma. Persecuted in New York, tarred and feathered in Ohio, forced to leave Kirtland driven out of Missouri, slandered and rejected by former friends, imprisoned in Liberty Jail, forced into hiding in Illinois, and on and on and on. It's going to crescendo in Carthage with a martyr's crown. But the common lot all the days of his life, and then this perspective into his personality. And for what cause, it seems mysterious. It's like, I have no idea why they always attack me. Unless I was ordained from before the foundation of the world for some good end or bad, as you may choose to call it, judge ye for yourselves. God knoweth all things, whether it be good or bad. <laughs> Those phrases amaze me. It's like, I don't know why I've been persecuted all this time. He says a similar thing in Joseph Smith history. He says, I was an obscure boy of no consequence. I'm a nobody. Why would anybody waste their time opposing little old me? Oh, unless maybe I'm not so little after all. I pictured myself as, as a boy of no consequence. Perhaps God saw greater potential in me, which then may have had the adversary see that potential and get concerned about it himself. He says that in Jesus' history also, that maybe I was persecuted because Satan knew that I would prove to be a disturber and an annoyer of his kingdom. I love that. Anyone who's ever been called disturbing or annoying, just know that you're following the prophet. Okay? Now, but be sure you know what you're annoying and disturbing. Disturb and annoy the right things, or in Satan's case, the wrong things. Okay? But there he is. And he lets people decide for themselves. I love that he's not trying to defend himself against everything. It's just like, nope, I'll let, I'm willing to let my life be, be put on trial. That's, that's a gutsy thing to do. I mean, this is the same man who canonizes his mistakes in the Doctrine and Covenants. And the times that the Lord chastens him, he publishes to the world. I never said I was perfect. I will let you judge for yourselves if my life has been a good one or a bad one. I'll let you call it what you will. I get it. I am a polarizing person. Prophets always are. The people will try to destroy your reputation and influence, but also, as we learned two weeks ago, that thy people will never be turned away by the testimony of traitors. I love Joseph's almost nonchalance. It reminds me of Nephi when he's talking about the Book of Mormon at the end of 2 Nephi 33. It's like, hey, just I'll let you judge yourself about this book if it comes from the Lord or if it doesn't. I mean, Jesus had that nonchalance. If any man will, will do his will, he'll know of the doctrine, whether it be of, me, of God or whether I speak of myself. Same thing. Just try it. Experiment upon the word. Just judge for yourselves because God knows all things, whether it be good or bad. And I'm amazed that Joseph only cared about the Lord's opinion of himself. And even when the Lord's commandments made Joseph look bad among other people, we'll see that next week with plural marriage, I will obey God's commands no matter what. You go ahead and judge my life. Does anyone have the guts to say that? Joseph did. And I'm impressed by that. He then goes on, Nevertheless, deep water is what I am wont 
to swim in. Now be careful the way he spells want. It's not W-A-N-T. It's W-O-N-T. Now we usually go, isn't that won't? And isn't there an apostrophe? I love that it's W-O-N-T and it's not want with an A and it's not won't with an apostrophe. Because if it's saying, oh, well, deep water is what I want to swim in. I like it. No, he's not asking us to ask for that kind of stuff. It's like when people say, oh, adversity makes you strong, then bring it on. I want to get strong. Don't pray that way. It's going to come regardless, okay? It's not that he wanted to swim in the deep water. Who, who doesn't want a little easier life if it's a possibility? He didn't ask to be tarred and feathered. He didn't ask for a lifetime of persecution. But it came. And that's where the other W-O-N-T, but with an apostrophe, comes in. It was neither of an, an I want it, but neither was it an I won't do it. It's I will accept God's will for me. Whatever it might be, it's what I'm want. See, in 1828, the dictionary, if you look up want, it simply means accustomed. I'm used to it. Deep water is what I am used to swimming in because it's been that way my whole life, the common lot, all the days of my life. In fact, he once said, I have waded in tribulation lip deep. That's a great mental image. Can you picture somebody so deep that it's come up over the lip and now it's just their, their nose and the, the top of their head that's above? Oh, that's, that's, I mean, you don't want to get any waves because then you're, you're all the way under. But he's wading in tribulation lip deep. But he goes on, every wave of adversity... So sure enough, it it splashes him in the face every once in a while. Every wave of adversity which has struck me has only wafted me that much nearer to deity. Oh, there is a buoyancy in Joseph Smith's indomitable soul that is, even when the waves crash, they're just lifting him higher and higher to God. He is coming to know him in his extremities. The Son of Man descended below all things. Well, no wonder his head's going to reach the top. He's being borne up from beneath. I love his perspective here. He goes on, It all has become a second nature to me. And thankfully that second nature is overcoming the first nature, namely the natural man. The Lord is is changing me through all of these trials. I feel like Paul to glory in tribulation. For to this day has the God of my fathers delivered me out of them all and will deliver me from henceforth. For behold and lo, I shall triumph over all my enemies for the Lord God hath spoken it. Talk about faith and faithfulness. Courage in the face of tribulation. Hide in an attic but being able to stand full, full height and, and full strength, speak to the saints, I'm going to triumph over my enemies. God promised, and I trust those promises. I will overcome the future because God has delivered me from the past. He's always been th- there for me, and that will not change. So, verse 3, let all the saints rejoice, therefore. Be exceedingly glad, for Israel's God is their God, and he will mete out a just recompense of reward upon the heads of all their oppressors. God is on their side, and the prophet knew it. That seems to be a common attribute for every prophet, just this incredible optimism, because they know who's in charge. In verse 4, again, verily thus saith the Lord, let the work of my temple and all the works which I have appointed unto you be continued on and not cease Let your diligence, your perseverance, and patience, and your works be redoubled, and you shall in no wise lose your reward, saith the Lord of hosts. If they persecute you, so persecuted they the prophets and righteous men that were before you. For all this there is a reward in heaven. So much in that verse. If if they persecute you, welcome to the club. You are in good company. That's how darkness has always responded to light. But there's a reward in heaven. So put your trust and faith in that. In the meantime, what should we be doing? If no unhallowed hand can stop the work from progressing, then certainly don't pull back your hallowed hands. Uh, Engage in the work. Don't slow things down just because of outside opposition. Let the work of the temple continue. Don't let it cease just because there's people standing in the way. In fact, I love the the attributes he's calling upon us to, to muster. Diligence, perseverance, patience, work. In fact, redouble them. Don't slow down. Speed up. 
and give more than you've given in the past. By the way, all those attributes are necessary not just to build the temple, but to do the work that the temple allows us to accomplish. Uh, my, my mother is an incredible genealogist. She's so engaged in family history work. My dad too, but it's amazing to just watch. My mom, is, it's always on her mind. And, and it, it requires diligence and perseverance and patience and work. And sometimes even that isn't enough. So you have to redouble it and do even more. It's interesting because I think a lot of us were used to that on, on missions among the living. And I don't know why we just assumed that missions among the dead would be just easier. That it would require less diligence and perseverance and patience and work. Now, if, if we serve a mission and if you labor all your days in crying repentance and bring save it be one soul unto me, how great shall be your joy in heaven with, a, in, with him in the kingdom of my father. Is that any different for the dead than the living? And so if you'd be willing to spend 18 to 24 months and maybe see one person join the church, why do we give up on genealogy if the names just don't just pop up on the computer screen? It's worth all of that effort as we begin now to learn about baptisms for the dead. That's what he gets at in verse 5. Again, I give unto you a word in relation to the baptism for your dead, which, like he said in verse 4, shouldn't cease. Don't slow down just because I'm in bondage, or at least under house arrest. Uh, make, help the work move forward. Verse 6, here's some more details about it. Verily thus saith the Lord unto you concerning your dead. When any of you are baptized for your dead, let there be a recorder, and let him be eyewitness of your baptisms. Let him hear with his ears, that he may testify of a truth, saith the Lord. So that's the latest development we're getting in this line upon line, precept upon a precept, understanding of this practice. Again, originally it was, whoa, it's possible. And they're beelining it to the Mississippi. Next step in section 124 was, oh, it needs to be in a baptismal font. Let's work towards that quickly as we can. Next step, oh, there needs to be a recorder present. That makes sense. Somebody needs to write down who, that someone was being baptized for someone else, and that way records are being kept. We've been a record-keeping church from, from day one, literally, April 6, 1830. A record should be kept. Now, verse 7, there's a heavenly reason for all of this, that in all your recordings it may be recorded in heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth may be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth may be loosed in heaven. So what we already knew from, from Matthew chapter 16, for example, the binding and loosing, now we're going to add recording. And what's written down here is written down there. We're going to see the importance of that repeated in section 128. And I wonder if it goes beyond just the recording of temple baptisms. Because in verse 8, it seems to expand it. For I am about to restore many things to the earth pertaining to the priesthood, saith the Lord of hosts. You see, I wonder there if the Lord is saying, you need to get into the habit of writing things down. Because as much as I've been restoring up to this point, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. And I'm about to restore many other things pertaining to the priesthood. Remember, it's going to distill like the dews of heaven, right? And so you need to understand more and you've got to learn to write it down. One of the greatest sources in the early days are the journals of Wilfred Woodruff. He just had a gift where, I mean, he couldn't, or a curse maybe, uh, he couldn't fall asleep at night if he hadn't written down what happened that day. And he was meticulous in his record keeping. He had a gift where he could often just remember what Joseph had said, and it would stay in his head until he had a chance to write it all down, and then it was taken. Kind of make space for the, for the next day's download, I guess. Uh, but so much of what we know about early church history comes from those journals. And even something as, as important as Joseph passing down the apostolic keys to the Quorum of the Twelve. At one point, Wilfred even kind of chastens the other members of the Quorum of the Twelve, saying, you all needed to write those things down so we would have additional witnesses of the reality of that. That would help in the succession crisis, okay, to have made it clear from the get-go what the Lord's intention was. There's many things that God is going to restore, and we need to have records of it. So get used to it. Don't just bind in our, on earth and have it bound in heaven. Don't just loose on earth and have it loosed in heaven. Record on earth so it's recorded in heaven. Verse 9, again, let all the records be had in order. This is a house of order, after all. 
that they may be put in the archives of my holy temple to be held in remembrance from generation to generation, saith the Lord of hosts. A record-keeping people indeed. Verse 10, I will say to all the saints that I desired with exceedingly great desire to have addressed them from the stand on the subject of baptism for the dead on the following Sabbath. But inasmuch as it is out of my power to do so, I will write the word of the Lord from time to time on that subject and send it to you by mail, as well as many other things. So there he is, as we said before. I can't come, but I can send. And I intend to do more of that. I'll do it from time to time, just like the Lord does that for me from time to time and line upon line and precept upon precept. I do love the way he said at the beginning, though, with I desired with exceedingly great desire. That's a lot of desire. Jesus says the same thing when he talks about the Last Supper, that with desire have I desired to partake of this Passover with you. This is a deep, heartfelt just feeling a longing. And for Joseph, it was a longing to be with the saints. That was part of his personality, just loved people. And also part of the, his growing uh, sense of, of public speaking, I just want to preach from the pulpit. That's, that's my favorite thing to do on Sunday, is just to give a sermon there in the grove and teach the Latter-day Saints the truths that God is revealing to me. I mean, the Nauvoo period had far fewer revelations, but had far more public discourses. And it's just interesting to see Joseph grow into that part of his calling as well. Uh, for this one, so far, basically, what did we get in section 127? As far as working uh, the work of the dead, one little addition, you need to record things. But it's a step in the right direction. We're going to get more of it in 128 and more beyond that. But for now, it's enough for a letter. Get a recorder. I actually remember when I took uh, the young adults in Tennessee up to, to Nauvoo uh, to do a church history tour. And we went to the temple to do baptisms for the dead. And it was amazing. And I just, I talk about a historic temple. That's where baptisms for the dead were first revealed. And I just, I wanted to be baptized there. But I was one of the, the older adult leaders. And when I came in and everyone else was getting ready for baptisms, I said, oh, can you help? Just be a witness. And I, I was like, oh, of course, I would love to. Even though my heart was like, I just want to be able to be in the baptismal font to baptize or be baptized. Instead, I had to stay and just watch. And at first I was kind of throwing a little pity party for myself until I remembered section 127. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm a witness. I'm helping with the recording here. Where by, what, with, being an eyewitness, uh, and hearing with my ears everything that was said back in verse 6, I'm like, whoa, I am fulfilling section 127 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, it was kind of nice. Anyway, to be able to help see the saints moving forward in their understanding because of what Joseph is revealing here, it's a beautiful statement in this letter. Then 11, he's finishing. I now close my letter for the present. So for the present, there's going to be more coming. Just wait for the next revelation. But I'll close for the present for the want of more time, for the enemy is on the alert. And as the Savior said, the prince of this world cometh, but he hath nothing in me. I love that Joseph is turning to the scriptures for an understanding of his circumstances, for strengthening and encouragement to get through this hard time. It's like, oh yeah, I'm in good company too. The Lord went through similar things. His servants have always gone through these kinds of things. The prince of this world is always out to get those that disturb and annoy him. Well, he's got nothing in me. I'm not going to stop. Then verse 12, Behold, my prayer to God is that you all may be saved. That's all I care about. What happens to me doesn't matter much. As long as what happens to all of you is ultimately your salvation. And I subscribe myself your servant in the Lord, prophet and seer of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joseph Smith. To subscribe, by the way, we usually think of that in terms of like, oh, I'm going to order a magazine or something. But to sub below, scribe, write, I'm going to subscribe myself. I'm just going to sign my name down below. So literally, subscribe just means kind of attach your signature at the bottom. But it also means to bind oneself because of that signature. 
Again, when you subscribe to something, you're promising, I will pay for this as you keep sending me issues of the magazine or the newspaper or whatever. But here, I subscribe myself. I'm signing my name to the bottom of this to covenant with you. I promise to be this. I subscribe myself, your servant in the Lord. I love that that one comes first. And the second one is prophet and seer of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That he saw himself, even before he saw himself as prophet and seer, he saw himself as servant. Let him that is chief among you be servant of all. That's exactly what Joseph was, was doing. It's what he was subscribing himself to be. A true servant leader. And that's exactly what he was. Well, he sent this and eventually got in the hands of William Clayton, who read it to the saints in the grove, and they were so grateful to hear from their prophet in hiding. In Joseph's journal, he recorded, When this letter was read before the brethren, it cheered their hearts and evidently had the effect of stimulating them and inspiring them with courage and faithfulness. I mean, how could it not? Deep water is what I want to swim in. You can swim in yours. It's fine. They're just, just wafting us higher to deity. Uh, common lot all the day. It's just envy. It's not just wrath, okay? The wrath is just to hide the envy. We can get through this, I promise. God is with us. He is our God. He's promised us ultimate triumph. Rest assured in that. Again, there's this sense of him. I mean, no wonder he's thinking about the dead. The ultimate bondage, Right? No wonder he's thinking about those in spirit prison and how do we help them get free? I'm, I'm feeling trapped by mine enemies. Well, when sin and death are the ultimate enemies, they deserve to be freed. So let us cry deliverance to the captives. He does it in section 127. He does it again just a few days later. Can't stop thinking about this. So he writes another letter and sends it back to the saints. 128 verse 1, As I stated to you in my letter before I left my place, that I would write to you from time to time, again, line upon line, to give you information in relation to many subjects, I now resume the subject of the baptism for the dead. Why that one, as opposed to so many other things that could have been on his mind? As that subject seems to occupy my mind and press itself upon my feelings the strongest since I have been pursued by my enemies. Did you catch the two body parts he listed, by the way? I just can't stop thinking about it. It occupies my mind. Oh, and it also presses itself upon my feelings the strongest. Remember what Joseph learned in section 8? That, revel that revelation by definition is when God speaks to the mind and the heart. You remember his experience in J with James 1.5 when he was 14 years old? Never had any passage of scripture come with more power to the heart of man than that did at that time to mind. I reflected upon it again and again. So there's heart and mind again. Here you see it. It occupies my mind. It presses itself upon my feelings. Joseph is having a revelatory experience about work for the dead. And similarly for us, if there's just a doctrine or a principle that just, it occupies our mind. It presses itself upon our feelings. God is trying to reveal truth to you. So as Moses did with the burning bush, turn aside to see. Pull out a pen, a quill, whatever, and some paper and get ready to record some things from time to time. As God tries to reveal these truths to us, Joseph is living. It's just a perfect embodiment of this process. It happens to him all the time. Now, verse 2, I wrote a few words of revelation to you concerning a recorder. So that was the emphasis in section 127. Well, I've had a few additional views in relation to this matter, which I now certify. So this is such a great example of line upon line. I wrote to you all that I knew last time, but I just can't stop thinking about it. And so record, yeah, duh, of course it needs to be written down. If it's going to be bound in, on earth and have bound in heaven, no wonder it needs to be recorded on earth to be recorded in heaven too. Perfect. So we're going to have somebody called to be the recorder. It's exactly what needs to happen. And then it's like it dawns on him because verse two, it, it clarifies. That is, it was declared in my former letter that there should be a recorder who should be eyewitness and also to hear with his ears that he might make a record of a truth before the Lord. But here's what I learned since then. Verse three. Now, in relation to this matter, it would be very difficult for one recorder to be present at all times and to do all the business. I mean, duh. 
who on earth is going to be able to be an eye and ear witness of every baptism for the dead when everybody wants to do them all the time? Wow, how do we, how do we fix this? Heavenly Father, what's the best approach? You received truth. You reflect on it. You start to try to make sense of its implications and more questions arise that you can then take to the Lord to receive additional insight. It's perfect. So what's the insight? To obviate this difficulty, there can be a recorder appointed in each ward of the city. We've talked about stakes a lot. Well, now we first see the idea of wards. And there were 10 in Nauvoo at the time. So every ward needs to have a recorder. And notice his description who is well qualified for taking accurate minutes. After all, if it's going to be recorded in heaven, we better get it right here on earth. Let him be very particular and precise in taking the whole proceedings. So there are some part of that qualifications is the personality traits that would, that would make you the, the right kind of person for this job. Certifying in his record that he saw with his eyes and heard with his ears, giving the date and names and so forth and the history of the whole transaction, Naming also some three individuals that are present, if there be any present, who can at any time when called upon certify to the same, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. You, see, you get a sense of how careful Joseph is being? I mean, if there was a thought of... I mean, he took that correction very carefully back from section 124. It's like, oh, you're only accepting our Mississippi baptisms out of... with a wink and a nod? And if we don't eventually get it right, you're going to reject us and our dead? Hello. We, this is serious stuff. This is not some kind of casual approach. And so let's be very particular, very precise. I mean, if we're going to be called to the witness stand someday to verify that other people have received the ordinances of salvation, well, okay, we, got to, we, got, we need good records. Then, verse 4, let there be a general recorder to whom these other records can be handed. So kind of like bishops and then a presiding bishop, well, there's recorders in the wards, and then there'll be a general recorder for the church. Being attended with certificates over their own signatures, certifying that the record they have made is true. Then the general church recorder can enter the record on the general church book with the certificates and all the attending witnesses with his own statement that he verily believes the above statement and records to be true. From his knowledge of the general character and appointment of those men by the church, and when this is done on the general church book, the record shall be just as holy and shall answer the ordinance just the same as if he had seen with his eyes and heard with his ears and made a record of the same on the general church book. These verses are extremely long, by the way. There's almost a sense of like legalese where we want to close off every loophole. We'll see more of that in section 132 next week uh, because when things are are bound on earth and bound in heaven, recorded here, recorded there. Yes, these are, these are legal. And, and the justice of God requires an honoring of these ordinances. What you have performed on earth, I will accept in heaven. Now verse 5, you may think this order of things to be very particular. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I think. It's what you said it has to be, very particular and precise. Well, sure enough. But let me tell you that it is only to answer the will of God, a God of order, a God of particular truth. By conforming to the ordinance and preparation that the Lord ordained and prepared before the foundation of the world for the salvation of the dead who should die without a knowledge of the gospel. I mean, we need to be that ordered because God was. This was not some kind of last second like, oh, did anybody write that down? Rats, I can't remember who. No, God has been ordered from the beginning. His kingdom is a kingdom of order. And from before the foundation of the world, he made sure that there was a way for every single one of his sons and daughters to come home. That's what baptisms for the dead guarantees, that no one will ever go eternally forgotten. In an article published in the Times and Seasons, the church newspaper, a year later, Joseph said this, The great Jehovah contemplated the whole of the events connected with the earth pertaining to the plan of salvation before it rolled into existence. He knows the situation of both the living and the dead and has made ample provision for their redemption according to their several circumstances and the laws of the kingdom of God 
whether in this world or in the world to come. That's one of my favorite phrases from Joseph Smith, that God has made ample provision. What he described there in verse 5, prepared from before the foundation of the world, he, he guaranteed us. It's not what shall I do, it's whom shall I send? And whom shall I send to be Savior? To make sure there's a way to overcome sin and death. But also to restore truth, a dispensation of the fullness of times that will tie up every loose end so that when the Lord requires ordinances, he can also make sure that everyone has the opportunity to receive them. There is such mercy combined with that justice. The justice of requiring certain checkpoints to fulfill all righteousness, but the mercy to make sure that those checkpoints can be crossed by every child of God. That was part of his plan from the beginning. It's part of his ample provision, and we get to participate in it. From there, Joseph begins to explain the doctrine of work for the dead based on Scripture. And I love his approach to Scripture, as we'll see in the next couple of pages. Here's a man who has spent so much time in Scripture translating, restoring, trying to make sense of things, understanding truth, and, and to draw upon prior prophets. Remember, remember when, when Sidney Brigham was told to do that? That you need to call upon the prophets to prove Joseph's words? Well, Joseph has had enough time with Scripture now that he can do the same. And he can call upon past prophets to defend and, and explain the truths that, he is, that are being revealed through him. So verse 6, Further, I want you to remember that John the Revelator was contemplating this very subject in relation to the dead, which he declared, as you will find recorded in Revelation 20, verse 12. And then he quotes it. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. There's plural. And then beyond that, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, on the one hand, we could take that and just go, of course. I mean, God is our judge, and so we, we make it all figurative, and there's a book of life, and God records it all. We can sometimes picture things as a video of life, and, and we w roll tape, and we watch our life, and like, eh, yikes, this was more of a horror a movie than I thought it would be. Uh, and God judges us based on that. Well, in the days before film, well, let's put it in a book, okay? But there is a more literal component to that passage in Revelation, based on what Joseph then explains in verse 7. You will discover in this quotation that the books were opened, and another book was opened. So there's a careful reader, which was the book of life. But the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So let me explain that. Consequently, the books spoken of must be the books which contain the record of their works and refer to the records which are kept on the earth. So that's the big difference that Joseph is explaining here. This isn't all just books kept in heaven. There are books kept on earth. That's why we've been a record-keeping people from the beginning. The book, which was the book of life, is the record which is kept in heaven. The principal agreeing precisely with the doctrine which is commanded you in the revelation contained in the letter which I wrote to you previously to my leaving my place, that in all your recordings it may be recorded in heaven. And you see what Joseph is understanding here? It's like the revelation I got last time. We got it recorded. Because recording on earth has it recorded in heaven. Oh, wait a minute. Is that what John was talking about in Revelation 20? That the books are open? And the Lord has a, has a book of life, but also books containing our works? Are we writing that here? And having it recorded there as well? Whoa. We are, yes, we're part of our own judgment. Uh, we are recording the works of our lives that God will use to judge us by. Makes me want to do a better job recording my good days in my, in my journal. Uh, I'm, we always picture our sins being written in heaven, but for me to record the hand of God in my life and my efforts to love Him and love His, his children, that one I hope is recorded in heaven. Now, verse 8, Now the nature of this ordinance consists in the power of the priesthood, by the revelation of Jesus Christ, wherein it is granted that whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We saw that repeated in the previous revelation. 
this idea of God honoring what is done here by his authorized servants that are particular and precise and ordered and careful, of course he will honor those in the, in the world to come. He then goes on in verse 8, or in other words, taking a different view of the translation, and I love that, we're starting to get a sense of Joseph's perspective on scripture. He quotes something and then he says, well, in other words, now, that, that's kind of gutsy to be able to say, well, let me paraphrase scripture or explain it in different terms. Or as he says, taking a different view of the translation. Your hermeneutic is a word that they talk about in divinity school, about your interpretive lens. How do you interpret scripture? What do you think that means in our day? Well, Joseph had an interesting hermeneutic of flexibility, I call it. That he could see something and think, ah, I see the truth there. Well, let me put it in other words. Let me take God's words to Peter and now make them God's words to Joseph and try to make sense through the Holy Ghost that is in me what the Lord was trying to, to reveal to another prophet. Let me give you a different view of the translation. And then he does. Whatsoever you record on earth shall be recorded in heaven. Whatsoever you do not record on earth shall not be recorded in heaven. For out of the books shall your dead be judged according to their own works whether they themselves have attended to the ordinances in their own propria persona, that's just Latin for your own person, you did it yourself, for yourself, or by the means of their own agents, it's like proxy work, according to the ordinance which God has prepared for their salvation from before the foundation of the world, according to the records which they have kept concerning their dead. So another very long verse there. But to understand whether it, you did it for yourself, my own baptism at age eight, or whether the baptisms I perform for other people on their behalf by proxy. Either way, if those are recorded on earth, they are recorded in heaven. Uh, and that goes right along with what the Lord said to Peter about binding on earth and having it bound in heaven. Several years ago, there was a publisher in Europe that was creating an encyclopedia of biblical reception. And what they mean by that is not just what did the scripture say, but how have people understood it, received it into their lives ever since. And they were trying to write encyclopedia articles on practically everything in the Bible. And how was it received in, old, in, in ancient Israel? How was it received in the early church? How was it received in the Reformation? How was it received in modern America? Well, they reached out to me and said, will you write a couple of articles for this encyclopedia of biblical reception? And I said, sure, which ones did you have in mind? And they said, well, you write one about the Lord's Day. Uh, just how does, how does the, the view of the Christian Sabbath in American religious history, since that's my field? I'm like, sure. And they said, and we're, we're, we're working on the L's, okay? So if you can do the Lord's Day, and if you can do one on loosing and binding, based on that text in Matthew 16. And when they asked me that one, my eyes lit up. I was like, hey, you have no idea what you're asking. You want a Latter-day Saint? to write about the reception history of that passage in American history? Well, this one's going to have a heavy dose of the restored gospel because there's no church in American history that has understood that passage, received that text from the Bible in quite the same way as us about binding on earth and having it bound in heaven. The loose on earth, loosed in heaven, recorded on earth, recorded in heaven. Oh, Joseph's understanding of that translation, his different view, oh, it was different indeed. And it was beautiful because it opens a perspective on that that involves the salvation of God's children that wouldn't have had a chance to receive it otherwise. Or if you want to go the other path, that would, we'd have to explain away Jesus's emphasis on baptism, whether to Nicodemus or in his own mortal ministry. Interesting. It, the, what, what the Lord is allowing us to understand here is, is truly profound. Then verse 9, it may seem to some to be a very bold doctrine that we talk of. <laughs> you think so? Oh, talk about an understatement there. That's pretty bold. You really think that God's going to honor what you do here and he'll honor it there? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's exactly what we believe. Pretty bold. I mean, a power which records or binds on earth and binds in heaven, that's about as bold as it gets. That we can, well, think of it this way. We can say to hell itself that does not want to deliver up its captives, 
Oh, you have to. Because this person repented of their sins and was baptized by immersion for their remission. They're clean through the atonement of Christ. They are free to go. In some ways, it's, it's anything we do with that sealing power. Here, it's baptisms for the dead. But think about sealing for the living and or the dead. It's a bold doctrine that someone will say, Oh, I can bind on earth this couple. And death itself has to back down Death can, you see, no other church has that boldness. And they all admit it in the way that they perform marriages. We'll talk more about this next week in section 131 and 132 with eternal marriage. But you want to talk about a bold doctrine. Every other church admits, I have no power over what happens on the other side. And so the best I can say is, till death do you part. Or I can soften it a little. I can say, for as long as you both shall live, or for the period of your mortal lives, Say it however you want. It still is admitting, I can't stare down death. Sorry. I have authority from my church or from the government to bind you on earth, and that's as far as it goes. My authority does not, does not span the grave. It doesn't affect anything on the other side. But you want to talk about boldness. To be able to stare down death and say, you cannot split up this family. To stare down death and say, you have to honor what we did on the other side. To boldness, you better believe it. I shared this in, in prior lessons a long time ago. But when I was in Tennessee and trying to answer questions about the, the restored gospel to people of other faiths, and one sweet little old grandma that wasn't so sweet to me, was just angry that she couldn't go to her granddaughter's wedding. And I realized, ah, your granddaughter's a convert, isn't she? Uh-huh. And she wants to get married in the temple, and you can't go. And she was mad. And I'm, I, I can't blame you. But to hear how I answered, which I'd never answered it this way before, it was one of those open your mouths and it should be filled kind of experiences, because this sweet woman deserved a better answer than I could have given on my own. You see, too often we talk about, well, yeah, you can't go into the temple unless you're worthy. And before I, gratefully, that didn't come out of my mouth. I knew in advance before that it would be like, ooh, that's not, <laughs> I'm just, I just branded her unworthy and that's why you can't come. And this sweet little old grandma was probably as worthy as anyone in the wedding party that actually could enter the temple. So in an instant, the spirit was like, it's not about worthiness. There's a different issue here. And that's when it struck me about the boldness of this bold doctrine that we talk of. And so I leaned into that boldness and I asked this grandma, do you believe that Joseph Smith was a true prophet? And she was like, what? Uh, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but no, I don't. And I said, oh, my feelings aren't hurt. I can't blame you, but I do. So while we're on the subject, do you believe that Joseph Smith has the power, that he received priesthood keys from Moses and Elias and Elijah, and Peter, James, and John, John the Baptist? And she's like, whoa, you guys are crazier than I thought. I'm like, yeah, maybe. Or it really happened. Do you believe that it did? She's on. Like, sorry, but no. I'm like, well, sorry, but yes for me. I do believe those things happen. So another question, do you believe that that sealing power, and I explained a little bit what it was, to bind on earth and have it bound in heaven, to stare down death and say, you can't break up this couple. Do you believe that authority has been restored and is found in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and is held by sealers in the temple. Do you believe that? And again, she waved the white flag and said, no, I, I'm sorry, but I don't believe any of that. And I said, you don't have to apologize. I understand where you're coming from, but I need you to understand where I'm coming from because I believe all of that. And so when I go to the temple and when you don't, it's not a matter of you not being worthy to come. And it's certainly not a matter of you not wanting to be there to support and love and, and cheer on your granddaughter. You, you can do all of those things at the reception and, and throughout life and everything. Here's the one thing you need to understand about the temple. Because in the temple, it's the only place where that power is held to bind a couple on earth and have it bound, have that couple bound in heaven. A very bold doctrine that we talk of. But that's impossible unless it's possible. And then the Spirit just whispered the, the one story that she needed to hear. And I've shared it with all kinds of people ever since. 
I said, do you remember the story of the raising of the daughter of Jairus in the New Testament? And this is the Bible Belt, so of course you knew it. And I said, you remember when Jesus went to go raise this girl from the grave, from the dead? And he said to the people that were there, because the place was packed with people who loved her, who were worthy to be there for her, who wanted to support the family, that were mourning her loss. And Jesus says, don't mourn. I'm about to, she's just sick and I'm, she's sleeping and I'm going to wake her up. And what's the response? They laughed him to scorn. Because to them, it was, that's a bold doctrine. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to wake her up. You're going to raise her from the dead. That's impossible. And so it was their doubt that mocked him. And if there's one thing that cannot be present when a miracle needs to be performed, it's doubt. And so what does Jesus do? He doesn't kick them out. But neither does he invite them in. Because to come into the room where the impossible needs to become possible... Only faith can be present. So let me bring in Peter, James, John, mom, dad, and me. As Jesus enters that room and, and calls down death, speaks across the grave, and binds something, brings life out of the jaws of death itself, the impossible becomes possible. Because people that were there had faith that it could. I said to this sweet grandma, when I go to the temple, it's not as a spectator. I'm not just watching a marriage. I am willing the impossible into possibility. I am exercising faith. I am laying my belief on the stockpile, believing that this sealer is about to bind on earth a couple that will then be bound in heaven. I can't blame you for not believing in that. But I hope you don't blame us for only wanting faith to enter that building so that those kinds of things can take place. I promise, just like Jesus did, as soon as she was raised from the grave, what did he do? He brought her out to the waiting crowd that could rejoice with her. And that's exactly what we'll do for your precious granddaughter because you, I know you'd love her. I can feel that. I know you deserve, you are worthy to rejoice with her. But as you admitted, you don't believe what takes place within the temple. And I can't blame you for that. But I do. And I will, I will lean into that bold doctrine, even if other people can't. Thanks to the Spirit's words and presence, she completely accepted that and no longer was bitter or angry about missing something. She just recognized the limits of her faith, her belief in something that was admittedly incredibly bold. That's the case with work for the dead too. I love that phrase. Keep going in verse nine. Nevertheless, so despite the boldness of this doctrine, in all ages of the world, whenever the Lord has given a dispensation of the priesthood to any man by actual revelation or any set of men, this power has always been given. So if there's a dispensation of priesthood power, it will include the sealing power. They've got to be able to bind on earth and have it bound in heaven. That's just how it works. Hence, whatsoever those men did in authority in the name of the Lord and did it truly and faithfully, and kept a proper and faithful record of the same, it became a law on earth and in heaven, and could not be annulled according to the degrees of the great Jehovah. This is a faithful saying. Who can hear it? <laughs> With that, he's, it's like he's channeling John 6. This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Well, this is a faithful one. It may be hard to believe. It may be overly bold for some. But can you hear it? Do you believe this? It's true. God vindicates the prophets. God honors the, the best attempts of his authorized servants to do his work and his will. If it's done truly, faithfully, properly, if it's written down and recorded, God will accept it. That is sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. We'll see more of that next week in section 132. Now, again, he goes back to scripture. He, drew, he called uh, John the Beloved to the witness stand, to quote from the book of Revelation. Now he's going to call the Apostle Peter to the witness stand. 
Verse 10, again for the precedent. And that's a great thing to do with scripture. I'm looking for precedent here to show you. Matthew 16, 18 and 19, and he quotes it. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, or will prevail against it, will stare down hell itself. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Oh, it's beautiful to have a biblical precedent. I remember last week we saw not everything will have one. Some things are saved for the dispensation of the fullness of times alone. But the sealing power isn't one of those. That's always been there. And so that, there's a rock upon which the church is built. I, I love that verse is so amazing because you can almost chart the trajectories of different religions based on how they interpret that passage. If you're a Catholic, you look at that and go, oh, Peter, I mean, it's a play on words. Peter, Petros, Cephas, the, so Peter's the rock. And so there's where he was the first pope, the bishop of Rome. And so the papacy is the rock upon which God builds his church. The Protestants would say, no, 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 no. Peter declared faith in Jesus Christ. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Oh, that's the rock. It's our, it's our pro proclamation of faith in Jesus that builds, that, that's the, what the church is built on. A Latter-day Saint would go, um, is there a third option? Because when the Lord said, ah, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which art in heaven. Ah, there's the rock. God revealing, confirming truth to us. That's how he builds his church. Well, which of us is right, the Catholic, the Protestant, or the Latter-day Saint? Honestly, I would say all of the above, in a way. Uh, God does build upon a foundation of prophets and apostles. There's... There's the rock of Peter and his fellow servants. But also, it, God does build upon a rock of faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, Christ himself is the rock. And, and that revelation, or being able to make that declaration, depends first upon a revelation of that truth to us. So yeah, let's build upon the rock of Christ by declaring our faith in him, having received it through revelation, and continue to build upon prophets and apostles to do his work. It's all, it's all the rock. Now verse 11, now the great and grand secret of the whole matter, so now let's continue to give some explanation of the verses we've been quoting, and the summum bonum of the whole subject that is lying before us. He's, he used some Latin a little while ago about propria persona. Well, here's a little bit more. Summum bonum means the greatest good, the highest ideal. The ultimate goal of everything we're doing is this. It consists in obtaining the powers of the holy priesthood. For him to whom these keys are given, there is no difficulty in obtaining a knowledge of facts in relation to the salvation of the children of men, both as well for the dead as for the living. Now, I love the middle of that verse. If you hold those keys, then there's no difficulty in obtaining a knowledge of the facts. If we're trying to gain or seek the salvation of the children of men, living, dead, we're trying to do God's work and glory, participate in it with him, then those who hold the keys of the kingdom, oh yeah, it's not, it's no, there's no difficulty. Now that doesn't mean it all comes at once, right? We're seeing line upon line, precept upon precept, but the fact that lines keep coming and precepts are still forthcoming, oh, there's no difficulty there. In fact, as we saw Joseph go from baptisms to, oh, we need a recorder, to, oh, multiple recorders, one for each ward. This is making more sense. Oh, here's some scripture that's making more sense and, and clarity. Fast forward, 19, or 1845, Brigham Young reveals, ah, another insight. No, no problem here, no difficulty. It's, it's making more sense. Men need to be baptized for men, and women need to be baptized for women. The previous few years of doing baptisms for the dead, it, there had been no gender uh, clarification here. But that came clearly to, to Brigham Young, and we've been doing it that way ever since. It goes along well with the, art, the uh, proclamation of the world and the family. That gender is part of our eternal identity and purpose. And even the work we do for the dead honors that. Uh, gendered living reflecting gendered dead. Interesting. In fact, Brigham Young was talking about baptisms for the dead when he said, when an infinite being gives a law to his finite creatures, he has to descend to the capacity of those who receive his law. 
We, we saw that in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 1. We saw it in 2 Nephi uh, chapter 31. God speaks to us according to our language that we can understand. He has to condescend on a linguistic level or condescend on a comprehension level. What can they handle? How much milk? How much meat? How much lying now? How much lying later? What precept are they ready for? So, Brother Brigham went on. When the doctrine of baptism for the dead was first given, this church was in its infancy. The Lord has led this people all the while in this way, by giving them here a little and there a little. Thus he increases their wisdom, and he that receives a little and is thankful for that shall receive more. Again, speaking specifically of baptisms for the dead, when it was first revealed, all the order of it was not made known. Afterwards, it was made known that records, clerks, and one or two witnesses were necessary, or else it will be of no value to the saints. Joseph, in his lifetime, did not receive everything connected with the doctrine of redemption, but he has left the key with those who understand how to obtain and teach to this great people all that is necessary for their salvation and exaltation in the celestial kingdom of our God. I mean, that's Brigham Young's version of what we just read in verse 11. That's the summum bonum of the whole matter. In fact, another time I was in Tennessee talking to a group that was like, uh, how, how dare you say you're the only true church? And I was, I was like, well, we're, we're not saying that your churches are false. We're simply saying that they're incomplete. And then I looked at their face and realized, oh, they don't like that word any more than false. And then I heard myself say, and so are we. And I'm like, what? I was scrambling, going, what are you talking about? We're not incomplete. We have the fullness of the gospel. And then I realized, no, the ninth article of faith says we don't have the fullness yet. If there are yet many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God that God has not yet revealed, then we're incomplete too. And I shared that with this congregation saying, we're all incomplete. The, the only difference is, as Latter-day Saints, we believe that God has restored to us the conduit through which that additional light and truth will come. That the fullness will continue to flow through the channel of prophets and apostles as it always has in the past. So no falsehood. I'm not calling any of that out. But I am speaking of a shared incompleteness. And what we're trying to offer the world, I mean, to borrow the language of, one, of verse 11, is, is prophets and apostles who, because they hold keys, have no difficulty in obtaining a knowledge of facts in relation to the salvation of the children of men. Now, again, always keep in mind, line upon line, and what we're prepared for. But that was Brigham Young's statement. I love what he said there. God will continue to reveal as soon as we're prepared to receive it. He left the key with those who know how to turn it, how to open that key of knowledge so that revelation can continue to flow. We're seeing that in magnificent ways with President Nelson. Here's a, here's a prophet who seems to have no difficulty in obtaining knowledge from the Lord. Verse 12 Herein is glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. You get this sense of crescendo here. The ordinance of baptism by water, to be immersed therein in order to answer to the likeness of the dead, that one principle might accord with the other, to be immersed in the water and come forth out of the water, is in the likeness of the resurrection of the dead in coming forth out of their graves. Hence, this ordinance was instituted to form a relationship with the ordinance of baptism for the dead, being in likeness of the dead. So now we see a, a double symbolism in baptism by immersion. I mean, if you see Romans chapter 6, Paul makes clear that we are buried with Christ in our baptism, so we can be raised with Christ in a newness of life. There's his death and resurrection. Well, there's the death of the natural man and a resurrection of a new creature in Christ. But there's another level of that. It's not just our, the grave of the natural man. It's the grave in general. I mean, the vast majority of God's children, if they're ever going to find a baptism, it's going to be baptism for the dead more than baptism for the living. I mean, as important as perfect the saints is, that's tiny compared to proclaim the gospel. And as important as proclaim the gospel is, that's minuscule compared to redemption of the dead. That's the, I mean, our largest teaching and conversion pool is in the baptismal font in the grave. It's, it's baptism for the dead. And so to have 
a, a, an ordinance that draws a parallel, that forms a relationship with the dead because we're going under. It's just like the grave itself. It makes baptism both vertical, it connects me to Jesus and his baptism and his resurrection, and horizontal, it connects me to all my brothers and sisters who have ever lived. As I go down in the grave, I'm descending with Jesus, but I'm also descending with all of those who have passed on. And we are all coming up in newness of life. Verse 13, here's another wrinkle to add then. Consequently, the baptismal font was instituted as a similitude of the grave and was commanded to be in a place underneath where the living are wont to assemble, to show forth the living and the dead, and that all things may have their likeness, and that they may accord one with another, that which is earthly conforming to that which is heavenly, as Paul hath declared, 1 Corinthians 15, 46, 47, and 48, which he then quotes in verse 14. So he's called John to the witness stand, called Peter to the witness stand. Now he's calling Paul to the witness stand. We'll get his, his words in just a moment. But that phrase, no wonder the baptismal font is in the grave of sorts. We're going down in the water. Well, put the font itself down beneath where the living are wont to assemble. And so baptismal, the baptistry in temples are typically in the basement. I actually remember the first time my wife and I went to, to the Hawaii temple in Laie. Uh, we went to do a session, but some kind temple worker was nice enough to say, can I show you around the temple? Sure. I don't know if we'll ever get back to Hawaii. And we, we went and we're going, I, I can't remember exactly the, the layout of it, but he took us to the baptistry and I was like, wait a minute, we didn't go down any stairs. Um, I thought, it was, isn't it supposed to be in the base? This is not underneath where the living are wont to assemble. Uh, now, I don't know if he just was used to the question or if he read our minds or, or saw the confusion on our faces. But even without being asked, this sweet temple worker said, oh, some of you may be wondering uh, why this isn't in the basement. Well, actually, the temple is built into the side of the hill and where the baptistry is, is underneath where the hillside comes down. So technically it's underground, even though it's on the same level as other parts of the temple. And it was like, huh, nice. And now there are times where it's, uh, a basement isn't even an option, but again, they'll typically have the baptistry on a lower level than, than other ordinances that take place above it. And again, all of it is, is to be a similitude of the grave. And that idea of similitudes is what he's getting at by quoting Paul. The passage in 1 Corinthians 15, again, sure enough, great chapter for all kinds of things. Howbeit that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. Now, that seems to be a very strange passage. As far as Joseph was concerned, what did it mean? What kind of plainer translation was he giving? Simply that earthly things or earthy things are meant to bear witness of heavenly things. And so a, a burial in water is meant to be a, a, a similitude of the old natural man dying and being brought up as a heavenly being, the spiritual man or woman of Christ. Simply a statement pointing to the symbolism of our ordinances. And there's no more symbolic place in the church than the temple. So let those earthy things that you see or wear or say or do point you to heavenly things that where profound truths are hidden. He goes on in verse 14, And as are the records on the earth in relation to your dead, which are truly made out, so also are the records in heaven. This, therefore, is the sealing and binding power, and in one sense of the word, the keys of the kingdom, which consist in the key of knowledge. That goes back to the key of knowledge hinted at in verse 11, that sunum bonum. It's those who have the keys have no difficulty in obtaining that kind of knowledge. And so write it on earth, have it written in heaven, recorder, uh, sealing power. It, it's amazing what is happening in the temple. Bold doctrine, like we said. Then verse 15, now my dearly beloved brethren and sisters, let me assure you that these are principles in relation to the dead and the living that cannot be lightly passed over as pertaining to our salvation. 
for their salvation is necessary and essential to our salvation, as Paul says concerning the fathers, that they without us cannot be made perfect, neither can we without our dead be made perfect. So there again he's quoting Paul, but he, he reverses it. Because the way Paul says this is in the book of Hebrews, it says that they without us cannot be made perfect. And that's the part that's always made sense to me. It's like they don't have the ordinances, and, and so I can offer it for them. That's the, the genius of proxy work. If the Lord will honor what I do on earth and receive it in heaven, then I can be baptized for my ancestors, and God will accept that, because they can't make it without me. But what Joseph does here, which is so fascinating, is he takes Paul's language and reverses it. And it's not just that they can't make it without us. It's that we can't make it without them. Now, that's the more confusing direction, though, because it's like, what, what are they going to do for me? I mean, I don't need their help receiving these ordinances. I'm alive. I have the temple here, or I can be baptized. I can be confirmed. I can receive the priesthood. I can be endowed. I can be sealed. They, they, they're gone. They can't do any of that for me. But I love the thought that if help is bidirectional, right? Mutual benefit, mutual edification, all that we saw in earlier revelations. If we're in this thing together and one great family of God trying to lift one another, there's something beautiful about the reciprocity that takes place across the veil and that the temple allows to happen. Think of it this way. If, if hearts are turning from fathers to children, so that the earth isn't utterly wasted. We'll see that brought up in just a moment. If, if there's something, that, President Nelson has taught previously that salvation may be individual, but exaltation is always a family affair. We need each other for this. If we're going to receive all that the Father has, we need the whole family present for it. We need binding, sealing, keys. We need, if we're gonna be the family of God, we need to bring the whole family home, okay? And so what's interesting about that is, think about the temple work I can do for my ancestors because my heart turned to them. But can you picture them clean, freed from spirit prison, uh, joining the forces of righteousness in spirit paradise? Picture them, you, picture your ancestors receiving priesthood power since we do ordinations for the dead too. Imagine them being infused with the gift of the Holy Ghost since we've done confirmation for the dead. Imagine them being endowed with power from on high since we did endowments for the dead. Imagine them joining as family since we've done sealings for the dead. And all of that heart turning, you better believe their heart is turning to us. And as newly empowered, newly endowed, you better believe they can help us. It's not that we need the ordinances but we do need the power of our priesthood. We need the help of unseen hands. We need angels about us to help us navigate life. And who better to do it than those who've already navigated lives themselves and now are in a position where they can help us. I need all the help I can get. And if that can come from some of my, my kindred dead, that they without me cannot be made perfect. But once I allow that to happen, then I without them, I'm not going to make it either. But now they can come to my rescue. I help them help me. And in the process, we all become one. One with another and one with Christ. It's amazing. Oh, bold doctrine? Yes. Can't be lightly passed over? Yes. Therefore worth a redoubling? of our perseverance and our patience and our diligence and our work, this, this is bringing everyone home. This is living into the ample provision of our Father in heaven. In verse, 20, or verse 16, he finally gets to the passage that we would have thought would have spurred this whole conversation. But again, it doesn't come out of scripture. It comes out of heaven. It comes through revelation. And only later, oh yeah, other prophets knew it too. Well, 16. Now in relation to the baptisms for the dead, I will give you another quotation of Paul. 1 Corinthians 15, not 29. 
And here's this famous passage that my professor put on her PowerPoint that spurred this whole conversation. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And then Joseph doesn't say anything about it. Just like Paul doesn't say anything about it. There's just an assumption you're supposed to know about baptisms for the dead. You're, you, you're practicing it. That's just evidence for the resurrection, which is what you're starting to, to waffle on. Interesting. Then 17. Again, in connection with this quotation, I will give you a quotation from one of the prophets. Let me give you another one. So I keep calling witnesses to the stand. One more I'll bring is going to be Malachi. The way he describes him, a quotation from one of the prophets who had his eye fixed on the restoration of the priesthood. The glory is to be revealed in the last days. And, the, and in an especial manner, this most glorious of all subjects belonging to the everlasting gospel, namely the baptism for the dead. And that's Malachi. I, I just love the description. Before he quotes Malachi, it's like, he, let me introduce you to. And here's someone whose eye is fixed on the last days. It's not going to happen in my day. So I'm putting all my eggs in the restorations basket. Is our eye fixed on the day we live in? Do we understand the, the, the weight of responsibility that's on our shoulders because of the day we live in? Are our eyes fixed on the glories of the last days or just the hardships that we have to pass through? Oh no, it's a glorious day. And, and do we recognize how glorious this particular subject is? I mean, the way, if you bring together all of these, these phrases about work for the dead, it occupies my mind. It presses itself upon my feelings. It's a bold doctrine. It, it's, it can't be lightly passed over. It's the most glorious of all subjects. I mean, if you can study section 128 and not want to beeline to the temple, Man, you've got some self-control. If you can study section 128 and not, not feel the spirit of Elijah, that mantle, fall from the chariot and have, uh, you know, a fire and just land on our shoulders and make us want to engage in the work for the dead. Again, you've got more self-control than most. The Lord is trying to help us feel about it the way the ancients did. This is how God ties up every loose end and we get to help in it. So he quotes Malachi, last chapter, verses 5th and 6th, this is the end of the whole Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's what happened in, just a few years ago at the Kirtland Temple to give the sealing power. It's there in every dispensation. It has to be there in ours. And so he came to do just that. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. There's the them without us and we without them can't be made perfect. The hearts are turning. Now you might scratch your head there and go, wait a minute. I thought we had a better way of saying that. When the angel Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith in 1823, he quoted Malachi, but he gave a better version because he talks about, I mean, here's just, well, he's going to come and turn some hearts. But, but Moroni's version was, no, he's going to come and plant promises through priesthood. It's all those P's that are missing. Okay, Elijah's coming to restore priesthood. And with that priesthood power, it will plant promises made to the fathers in the children. And the children, once they understand those promises, it's like, whoa, I want all my fathers to receive those promises. Hearts are turning. And the irony is here when Joseph is trying to explain and elucidate and give precedent and explanation for the work, he goes with the old Malachi version? Hmm. Well, perhaps sensing our confusion, verse 18, he admits, I might have rendered a plainer translation to this, but it's sufficiently plain to suit my purpose as it stands. Now, he's going to explain that purpose in, for the rest of this long, long verse. But let me just pause right there, because again, I think that shows the hermeneutic of flexibility that was at the root of Joseph's understanding of Scripture. Because, and I point that out because I think, unfortunately, we've lost some of that in culture, in church culture. You see, if we're surrounded by an evangelical Christianity that believes in scriptural inerrancy, and, and there's a sense of every single period and comma and, and, and every word. There was a book on uh, Christian fundamentalism and the author said, fundamentalists believe that the Bible came down from heaven like a sacred meteor. That it was just kind of encapsulated and God just said, here's the book. When in reality, God spoke through prophets. And then prophets had to try to put down 
in words, in language, the kinds of truths that God was revealing to them. And that's really hard. If you've ever tried to speak on behalf of God, whether it's a priesthood blessing or just speaking in church or trying to make sense of the... We talk about the ineffable. And if something's ineffable, then it can't really be put into words. If God is transcendent, then his truths transcend mere mortal language. So no wonder Joseph is always, always feels trapped by, by English, this crooked language he calls it, this prison of pen and ink. How do I put into words feelings? How do I make the ineffable effable? I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> How do I take the things I just can't? If I had not seen and ear had not hear, heard and hath not entered into the heart of man that which hath, God hath prepared for them that love him, then how on earth do I put it into, on the paper? Well, he did an amazing job, but no wonder he felt like it was a weakness. No wonder Moroni felt the same thing. I write it down and I just behold the, the awkwardness of my hands. And that's a struggle we all have. And so what's Joseph left with? Well, I'll do the best I can, but I'll pray that you eliminate the middleman in a way and try to go back one more level to the ultimate source. When I was in divinity school, we were talking about Advance, or Advantis, which is back to the sources, is what it's called. And that was the, the desire of a lot of early Christians. We've got to get back to the original manuscripts. But our professor wisely pointed out, is that actually the source? Or is, the step, is there still a step to take beyond the manuscripts? Is there a way to get back to the prophets themselves? Hmm. Or is there even another step beyond that? Because where did the prophet get it? And that's where revelation comes in. Because isn't God, be, if the prophet's behind the manuscript, but if God is behind the prophet, how do we get back to that source? Hello. That has to be direct. That has to be revelation. And, and nobody other than the Latter-day Saints, as far as I can tell, is trying to get back to that level. And so how does Joseph feel about scripture? I love his flexibility. Uh, and all the anti-biblicism I've studied, so often people that attacked the Bible were banking on people having an, iner an, an inerrantist hermeneutic. Sorry for the language, it's, it's the jargon. It's just the, he, they were banking on everyone being a literalist and every word is exactly as it is. I've talked before about the proving the contrary between divinity and humanity. And that's, a, that's key because if it's all divinity, the moment you see a speck of humanity, everything breaks. I see that in a lot of people who leave the church. They thought that church history was 100% divinity and 0% humanity. And the moment they see any humanity, the, the thing completely flips. That, they're talking about an overcorrection in the pendulum swing. Now it's 100% it's humanity and 0% divinity. Well, you were wrong both times. There, there's always been both. How else does God work through his children, right? And so if you look at scripture, for example, you will see divine and human fingerprints all over it. He speaks, according to man, uh, through, he speaks to man according to our understanding, our language, so we get it. That's how he has to do it. That's part of the condescension of God. And so I love that here you see Joseph's flexibility of, well, there's multiple ways for God to say this. And whether it's the version we have through the King James translators, whether it's the version I got from Moroni, I mean, I'll admit, Moroni's was plainer. And what I've done in the Joseph Smith translation is meant to be plainer. But I mean, there's truths from the old version, there's truths from the new. It, I'm, I'm amazed by this, to be honest. I mean, on the one hand, you might wonder, well, then why does Joseph need to quote scripture at all? Since it can just come directly from him. If he's back to the source, then, then why quote scripture? I mean, at one point, Joseph said, I refer to the prophets to qualify my observations, which I make. In other words, I turn to the scripture for precedent. We saw that earlier. Again, for the precedent. Here's Matthew 16. So why do I do that? Why do I turn to the scriptures for precedent? So that the young elders who know so much may not rise up like a flock of hornets and sting me. I want to keep out of such a wasp nest. <laughs> and I love Joseph kind of tongue in cheek. I'm, I'm calling scripture to give me precedent to prove my words, like Sidney Ringland was supposed to do. Just when people, who is on the Bible? <sighs> Does it have to be? Well, it is, and that's fine. I'll show you where it is in the Bible. I just don't feel so chained to it as you do, because I'm, I'm tapped into the direct link. 
I can eliminate the middleman because I'm, I know the source. And that's fascinating. Elsewhere he said, I suppose I'm not allowed to go into an investigation of anything that's not contained in the Bible. If I do, I think there are so many overwise men here that they would cry treason and put me to death. So I'll go to the old Bible and turn commentator today. He says that in the King Follett discourse. Again, some tongue in cheek. Joseph had a great personality. But there's almost a sense of like, oh, no, Bible, Bible. It has to be in the Bible. If it's not in the Bible, then forget it. It's like, fine, I'll go to the Bible. It's there. You just have to understand it the way God would have us understand it. In that same King Follett discourse, Joseph said, I thank God that I have got this old book. There's the Bible. But I thank him more for the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is a profound insight. I too am so grateful for the scriptures. They are a catalog of previous revelation, but they are also a catalyst for ongoing revelation that is personal and profound. That's when scripture becomes relevant, when we liken it to ourselves. I hope more than anything, this long year as we've been studying the scriptures together, you've gotten a sense of that just how much is packed in here? How much is behind the words? How much relevance there is in passages that typically we just skip over as seemingly inapplicable? Oh, I'm grateful for this old book, all of them. But I'm even more grateful for the gift of the Holy Ghost that opens these words to my understanding. Like we saw in Joseph Smith history after Joseph and Oliver's baptism. And the Spirit comes and they see things in Scripture they never would have understood previously. Their true meaning and intention. And that's what Joseph is trying to gain from these passages. Not just what they meant, there's exegesis, but their real intention in the situation they found themselves in. That's hermeneutic. And Joseph had a hermeneutic of flexibility, a hermeneutic of, of revelation, a hermeneutic of personal application. That to me is just beautiful. One of my favorite examples of it came in a discourse he get, gives in Nauvoo uh, when he's discussing the letters of Peter. And he says, the things that are written are only hints of things which existed in the prophet's mind. That is that's such a profound statement. What we have in scripture, it's not a meteor from heaven. It's not God having to dictate every single letter. It's that he revealed truth. I call it the revelation by dictation compared to revelation by depiction. Dictation is exact language. Depiction is more experiential or just, uh, again, a depiction of something. I felt something, I saw something. It's hard to put into language, but I'll try. It's a hint of what existed in the prophet's mind. And ideally, we, we bypass the prophet, thanking him along the way, obviously. But get back to the source of those hints and try to understand what the Lord would have us know because of them. I, I'm hoping that makes sense. It's, I love the topic. We could go down, stay on this tangent for quite some time. But based on that, that phrase, yeah, there's other ways to translate it. I could take Moroni's, I could take Ma King James or Malachi, whatever. It's really the truth is coming from God. Even in that sermon about Peter, he says, I mean, I could just quote Peter, but I'm going to, you'll recognize these doctrines in Peter, but I'd rather testify of the truths God has revealed to me. He revealed them to Peter too. You can read his language, you can read mine. We're, we're fellow witnesses within this cloud of witnesses, trying to make you witnesses of the truth as well. Amazing. Well, keep going in verse 18. And what is his purpose as it stands? Here it is. It is sufficient to know in this case that the earth will be smitten with a curse unless there is a welding link of some kind or other between the fathers and the children upon some subject or other. And behold, what is that subject? It is the baptism for the dead. For we without them cannot be made perfect, neither can they without us be made perfect. So we're now tying together Malachi and Paul. Neither can they nor we be made perfect without those who have died in the gospel also. So, ooh, so it's not just the dead who never got the chance. It's those who had the chance and took it. It's like we're all in this thing together. Okay, So it's not just I'm empowering my ancestors. There are those who were already empowered 
and they want to come to my rescue as well. And without that, the earth is smitten with a curse. Or again, to use Moroni's version of it, it's utterly wasted at his coming. And we talked about this way back in section two at the beginning, back in January. And what is, it, what is that utterly wasted? Well, if the earth was meant to be, I mean, this is all in the context of the family tree. And so at the beginning of Malachi 4, when it talks about neither roots nor branches, hmm, family tree, no roots, there's my ancestors, what I grow out of. No branches, there's my descendants, what grows out of me. And if the earth was created as a place where we could bind together God's family, prove ourselves, prepare ourselves, learn to become like him so we can return to be with him, then what an utter waste of an earth. If we turn it into a logging camp, no roots, no branches, instead of the forest of family trees it was intended to be. What a waste. How do we overcome that? How do we avoid the curse? It's the welding link. It's the sealing power. It's the turning and binding of hearts. It's baptism for the dead. It's the redemption of God's children. So he says, for it is necessary in the ushering in of the dispensation of the fullness of times, which dispensation is now beginning to usher in. Oh, it's just the start. We've got our work cut out for us. That a whole and complete and perfect union, a welding together of dispensations and keys and powers and glories should take place and be revealed from the days of Adam even to the present time. And not only this, but those things which never have been revealed from the foundation of the world, but have been kept hid from the wise and prudent shall be revealed unto babes and sucklings in this, the dispensation of the fullness of times. That's incredible. We're just starting this thing. We are babes and sucklings. We're just starting to, to get the milk and occasionally some meat enters into the diet as well. And God is revealing it. Here we are, 1841, it's just, this, we're scraping the surface. This is the tip of the iceberg. And the things that God is hoping to accomplish in this dispensation of the fullness of times, bringing it all together, whole, complete, perfect, welding, keys and powers and glories. Do you understand the days in which you live, Latter-day Saints? Now, Joseph's in an attic, <laughs> but it can't contain his enthusiasm for the kinds of things we are being called upon to accomplish in these last days. Not only every prior dispensation, bringing it all together, but as he says at the end, things that have never been revealed. So again, be grateful for the precedents, <laughs> you hornet's nest out there, but also realize that we won't have precedents for everything because some things only we were meant to accomplish. So we better get at it bold doctrine. You better believe it. And so with equal boldness, with boldness befitting that doctrine, Joseph just exults for the rest of this revelation. We often associate question marks with uh, Alma chapter 5, as Alma is just Oh, interrogating the people of Zarahemla. Are you prepared? So many great, it's a great you know, personal interview with a prophet. But if the question marks are all over Alma 5, the exclamation points are all over section 128. And from verse 19 through the end, there are 15 exclamation points as Joseph just can't keep it all in. And he has to just exclaim. He has to shout from this attic. Uh, I'm not going to be able to kept in hiding uh, much longer because he understands the day he lives in and what he gets to be involved in and, and he rejoices over it. Verse 19, now what do we hear in the gospel which we have received? And his answer, a voice of gladness, exclamation point, a voice of mercy from heaven, a voice of truth out of the earth. So from heaven out of the earth, Enoch talks about that in Moses 7. And, and to picture revelation from above, there's mercy from heaven. Book of Mormon out of the earth, there's truth out of the earth. Glad tidings for the dead, a voice of gladness for the living and the dead. Glad tidings of great joy. Now, Anytime you see that phrase in scripture, it refers to Christmas. The glad tidings of great joy. Joseph is like, this is better than Christmas. This is a gift I want to open every day and be involved in. 
Glad tidings of great joy. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those that bring glad tidings of good things. And that say unto Zion, Behold, thy God reigneth. As the dews of Carmel, so shall the knowledge of God descend upon them. Exclamation points all throughout that. The dew, it's like the dews of the, uh, like the doctrine of the priesthood will distill upon your soul as the dews from heaven. Knowledge from heaven will just appear. This is, remember when we talked about the peace and power of the Holy Ghost? Well, this is the peace side. It's just dew. The power side was section 121. Well might man put forth his puny arm and turn back the waters of the mighty Missouri River. Well, whether it's flowing down in torrents, like, uh, like the Missouri River, or it is distilling like dew from heaven, nothing can keep us from the peace and power of the Holy Ghost. God revealing truth to us. Verse 20, again, what do we hear? Glad tidings from Camorra. Moroni, an angel from heaven, declaring the fulfillment of the prophets, the book to be revealed. Now, it's not a solo voice. It's an entire chorus. So what's another one? A voice of the Lord in the wilderness of Fayette, Seneca County, declaring the three witnesses to bear record of the book. There's still more. The voice of Michael on the banks of the Susquehanna, detecting the devil when he appeared as an angel of light. The voice of Peter, James, and John in the wilderness between Harmony, Susquehanna County, and Colesville, Broome County on the Susquehanna River, declaring themselves as possessing the keys of the kingdom and of the dispensation of the fullness of times, exclamation point. Some of these voices we have on record and we know exactly what they're talking about. The angel Moroni coming to declare to Joseph Smith the, the Book of Mormon and it's time to come forth. Peter, James, and John restoring the Melchizedek priesthood. But things like the voice of Michael on the banks of the Susquehanna detect, detecting the devil as an angel of light, when did that happen? In some ways, it's like Joseph, it's like, oh, you'll have to forgive me if I, if I forgot to... He's not name dropping here, but it's almost like if he's the spiritual amphibian that his contemporaries made, uh, called him, then I guess I can excuse him for <laughs> forgetting some of the details now and then. And just in this rush of recollection, Spiritual experience after spiritual experience, manifestation after vision after revelation after... Pro it's incredible. He goes on in 21, again, the voice of God in the chamber of old Father Whitmer in Fayette, Seneca County, and at sundry times in diverse places through all the travels and tribulations, those go hand in hand, of this Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The voice of Michael, the archangel, the voice of Gabriel and of Raphael and of diverse angels from Michael or Adam down to the present time. What? Raphael? Where, where are you? When did you have all these experiences, Joseph? And it's like, oh, that's just part of the travels and tribulations of, that's prophethood for you. I'm just part of this cloud of witnesses and the veil can be paper thin. Oh, if we'll pierce the veil of unbelief, then God will throw open the veil of ignorance and and what happens as a result? This is from Adam all the way down till now. Notice the end of 21. All declaring their dispensation, their rights, their keys, their honors, their majesty and glory, and the power of their priesthood, giving line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, giving us consolation by holding forth that which is to come, confirming our hope. I'm here hiding out from the law, worried for my life, worried for my family, worried for my fellow saints. But nothing can stop this work from progressing. And to feel, oh, all of these ancient worthies, just the momentum building, this crescendo of the final dispensation with rights and keys and honors and majesty and glory. Line upon line, we're getting near the end of those lines. Here a little, there a little. Well, here comes a lot. And it's incredible to be living at a time where our hopes are being confirmed. Where our present is being consoled with promises of a glorious future. If you're struggling to find hope, then let the restoration confirm you in it. If you're having a hard time find, feeling consolation, then turn to the temple 
and realize that with it, as they're dotting the earth, God is tying up every loose end. He's crossing every T, dotting every I. His ample provision promised from before the foundation of the world is being fulfilled all around us. And more personally, it's being fulfilled by us. <laughs> what an honor. So with that in mind, verse 22, brethren, sisters, shall we not go on in so great a cause? They pursued us without cause. Well, we pursue the salvation of others with cause, the greatest cause of all time. When David has the courage to face Goliath, what does he say to those that lacked that courage? Is there not a cause? We have every reason to do this. When Captain Moroni is, is making the title of liberty and, boy, and, and hoisting it in every, in every fortification, every settlement, it's, it's to remind his people of the cause of Christ. Shall we no, not go on in so great a cause? Of course we should. We should. We're not, that's a rhetorical question. We're not supposed to answer it, at least not in words. We're supposed to answer it in action. And so what's the action Joseph's calling for? Go forward and not backward. Courage, brethren, and on, on to the victory. Let your hearts rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Let the earth break forth into singing. Let the dead speak forth anthems of eternal praise to the King Emmanuel, who hath ordained before the world was that which would enable us to redeem them out of their prison. For the prisoners shall go free. It's like Joseph would soon go free from this attic hideaway. The King Emmanuel, God with us, wants us to be with him. So he has let the mountains rejoice. We're trying to build the mountain of the Lord, a place of ultimate rejoicing because there's no bondage there. That is the place of freedom where every chain is broken. Let the dead speak forth their anthems. We're giving them voice to do just that. In the book of Revelation, you see frequently the kind of these expanding circles of songs of praise to the Father, to the Son, to the Lion and the Lamb. And the, the earth itself wants to break forth in that song. In verse 23, let the mountains shout for joy, especially the mountain of the Lord. All ye valleys cry aloud, even the valley of the shadow of death that the Lord is helping us navigate through. And all ye seas and dry lands, tell the wonders of your eternal King. Ye rivers and brooks and rills, flow down with gladness, whether it's the dews of heaven or the mighty Missouri. Let the woods and all the trees of the field praise the Lord. Ye solid rocks, weep for joy. You know, you, you, can you picture those emotional rocks out there that n never, a, never a wet eye? Well, never a dry eye now. Even the solid rocks are weeping for joy. Let the sun, the moon, the morning stars sing together and let all the sons of God shout for joy. In the book of Job, it says we did just that when the plan of salvation was first presented. We shouted for joy at the opportunity to come. Elder Maxwell used to joke that, yeah, then we get here. And theory turns to fact, and it's hard, and we start to wonder what all the shouting was about. <laughs> well, we'll remember as we engage in the work of God and realize that His ample provision has made it possible for all to come home, then yes, we will shout again. And this time it's not just shouts of anticipation. It's shouts of comprehension. It's shouts of realization. It's shouts of participation that we get to be a part of all of this. Let the eternal creations declare his name forever and ever. And again I say, how glorious is the voice we hear from heaven, proclaiming in our ears glory and salvation and honor and immortality and eternal life, kingdoms, principalities, and powers exclamation point. How can you not re... <laughs> Section 128 will get you out of your attic. It'll get us out of our lack of hope or lack of consolation. It will get us out of our fear or our apathy. These letters from Joseph are meant to propel us forward with a redoubled effort to build the kingdom of God.
So verse 24, behold, the great day of the Lord is at hand. It's go time. Who can abide the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appeareth? Now he's quoting Malachi 3 without telling you. <laughs> For he is like a refiner's fire. He's like fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. Why? That they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now that's Malachi 3. Another one of the chapters that Moroni quoted to a, a, a young 17-year-old Joseph Smith. It's been making more and more sense to him as time has gone on. Back in section, nine, er, section 84, he's to, he understands, oh wait, if we receive priesthood authority, Aaronic and Melchizedek, then we are the sons of, of Moses and of Aaron. And that's sons of Levi, whose sons we are. We don't have to wait for simply the gathering of, of scattered Israel. We're part of that. We are the sons of Levi. Then what's our offering in righteousness? Notice how he ends verse 24. Let us therefore, as a church and as a people, and as Latter-day Saints, offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. We're the sons of Levi after all. What is it then? Let us present in his holy temple when it is finished, and the sooner the better that we finish it, a book containing the records of our dead, which shall be worthy of all acceptation. A book containing our works, a book containing our records, recorded in, on earth so that it can be recorded in heaven, of the things we've bound on earth so they could be bound in heaven. I used to, it, it hit me that when, when foreign heads of state, or even presidents of the United States, come to visit the first presidency in Salt Lake City, what's the gift that is typically given them? It's such a perfect gift. It's something that we are uniquely poised to offer that most people can't get in any other way. It's a record of their dead. It's to say to this president or to this king or queen, here is your family. This is who you are. This is who you come from. This is identity and background. This is roots and branches. This is your tree of life. What a gift. And you can tell you that how moved they are that, wait, this, how did you know all this? <laughs> it's like, well, we have, our, we have our sources. We keep track of everything, okay? That's part of our, our role in this dispensation of the fullness of times. Here's your family. But you get a sense from verse 24 that it's not just to heads of state. It's not just to kings and queens. It's to the king of kings that we will offer a similar gift. We purified sons and daughters of Levi, having done all the work for all of your children, all the people for whom you made ample provision. Well, here it is. Here's your family tree, and not a branch or leaf is missing. To, to me, there's such a sense of second coming fulfillment or end of days, it, the work is done. Offering to the king of kings. Here's your family. And we've made it possible for every single one to come home. Just like you promised it would be. When you presented your plan of salvation with its ample provision. Verse 25, Joseph then ends this letter. Brethren. I have many things to say to you on the subject. Again, this is just the beginning. I've given you a line. Here's another line. There's more lines to come. But shall now close for the present and continue the subject another time. Now, you remember how he signed off from section 127, where it was a twofold. On the one hand, I'm, I subscribe myself as your servant in the Lord. And on the other, I'm also the prophet and seer of the church. Well, in an even more personal way, he signs off this next letter. And verse 25 ends, I am as ever your humble servant and never deviating friend, Joseph Smith. I feel the, the, just the truth and personality and love behind that language. Joseph was ever and always a humble servant and never deviating friend. A friend to the Lord, a friend to his fellow saints, a friend to anyone that would, that would allow him to befriend them. 
and what he was trying to share with his fellow servants and his fellow friends had to do with the never deviating love of God. A father who has made all things possible for us to return to him. I hope that the Spirit has conveyed to you some of the feeling that I have, that it's conveyed to me as I've, as I've shared my witness of these words. I hope in some small way you have felt God's never deviating love and kindness and his ample provision to bring all of his children home. May we join with him in that. Not just in the songs of praise, though he deserves them all, but in the work of redemption in his holy house as we bring all the family of God home to him.